All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started with our Education and Culture Committee meeting today. This is a discussion on the arts and humanities in Montgomery County. I'm going to ask uh, Susan Jenkins, our Chief Executive Officer of the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County, to please join us, as well as Deborah Lambert, uh, Fariba Kassiri, uh, Sonetta Nouvelle, uh, as well as uh, Randy Rump from uh, MCPS. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the arts and humanities as a whole in terms of what we've done regarding funding the arts as well as our Arts and Humanities Council's request uh, to grant based on demand. Uh, we're going to discuss some equity initiatives uh, that the Arts and Humanities Council has proposed as well as receive an update on our Executive Arts Ball. Um, review our funding for the Public Arts Trust, and also talk to our Montgomery County Public Schools about their role when it comes to supporting uh, the arts and culture in our community regarding their fine arts curriculum, as well as CTE Arts Media, and our communications program, and the Art Look Pilot program that's going on as well. So it seems that there's a lot going on within MCPS, which we were very happy about. Of course, we always want to see more. So. Um, I'll preface by saying that, but um, let me turn over to uh, Ms. Price, uh, who's going to walk us through the packet. I did want to uh, welcome uh, Councilmember Friedson as well as Count Councilmember Albernos uh, in joining us. So thank you very much for being with us today. Um, it is great to see, and I did want to just start off by saying it was um, at the beginning of this year, or actually, I guess the end of last year. Madam President, where you had decided uh, to try and create uh, some additional visibility uh, for the arts and through our conversation had said that we would pull uh, arts and humanities and libraries outside of the Health and Human Services Committee to elevate uh, arts and culture uh, and making sure that it was right in line uh, with uh, education, understanding that the role that we play in supporting and nurturing the arts uh, starts from our children and goes all the way up through economic development is incredibly important. And so from that perspective, uh, I know that when I met with Ms. Jenkins and had conversations with her uh, and other arts advocates throughout the county, there was some angst at first in terms of understanding uh, what something might this, uh, what something like this might look like. Uh, but when I had an opportunity to talk to uh, folks in our community uh, who cared about the arts and were arts advocates and told them about what it was that was my vision uh, for the arts. Having two daughters who are in the arts and just last night as I was talking to my oldest who's uh, now excited about the new plan, I'm not allowed to say what it is, uh, that's going to be for this upcoming year, but who was the lead in uh, her last uh, musical, Bring It On. Uh, it's one of those where, again, these are things that are incredibly important that we should talk about. We should talk about the opportunities that the arts play for us in our community, and more importantly, for our kids. Um, for myself, and I've shared this story before, but uh, and my daughter hates it, and as she gets older, she hates it even more uh, when I tell it, but um, is an introvert. She doesn't talk to a lot of people. She doesn't... Uh, and you know, when she gets on stage, she becomes a different person. Uh, and that's something that we've heard uh, through stories, whether it's people uh, who are incarcerated in Clarksburg Jail, working with Street Outreach Network and the great partnership uh, that's there uh, with uh, council, one of Councilmember Friedson's uh, residents uh, with Imagination Stage. It really is one where it says about what the arts mean. Uh, and I'll never forget the opportunity that I had to go uh, and visit one of our schools. And we talked about a black box theater and the school shall be remain un, uh, unnamed. I don't wanna uh, put it out there, but um, I talked to a young man there who uh, told me uh, his story. And he said, look, you know, I was getting involved in some stuff that I really shouldn't get involved in and people were trying to pull me into gangs. And, um, you know, my teacher, said, hey, why don't you come and try out for this play? And he said, try out for what? He said, I don't want to <laughs> have anything to do with any kind of play or anything. She said, trust me, I, I, I think you'll see that you'll like this. And he said that the arts saved his life. His words, not mine, 
not his teachers, the words of a young middle school student about what the arts mean. And that's incredibly important because it's likely that this young man would have been a statistic that we continue to talk about within our schools. He wouldn't have even had to have elevate to the point of where I have to read about him in the newspaper or watch him on TV. I'm just talking about one of the statistics where kids continue to fall behind because they don't feel connected, they don't feel as anything speaking to them and isn't living up to their fullest potential. We need to make sure that we are supporting the arts as a whole because the arts as a whole do so much for our community in so many different ways. Whether it's our public art that people look at and appreciate as they walk through our communities, whether it's the specialized programs that are there to allow them to express themselves, ensuring that within our schools they understand that there are different career pathways that they can take that are within the arts. There are so many realms that are there that we need to continue to lift up and elevate. And it is my hope that now that we have our Education and Culture Committee, that that's what the vision is that will be realized. One in which we understand how important the arts and culture are for our community, how they are an integral part of how we continue to grow and evolve as a community and make it an even better place for Montgomery County residents. So with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Price to walk us through. I am very happy to have all the representatives here and look forward to hearing your thoughts and your vision about how the council can partner together with you to ensure that we continue to lift up the arts and culture here in Montgomery County. Ms. Price. Thank you. Um, what you have before you today is a packet put together to discuss a number of topics in the arts and humanities sector. Um, it's one that has been growing. Um, as you can see in the packet, arts contributes $763 billion to the U.S. economy. That's more um, than agriculture, transportation, and warehousing. So it's only right that the county begin to revamp um, up our efforts in funding the arts and growing this sector, which has been flourishing in the county. Um, <clears throat> if you look at funding for the Arts and Humanities Council, over time it's um, experienced relatively small growth compared to where it was before the economic downturn. Um, looking at the um, chart that's attached on circle number one, it lays out a history of um, funding in the Arts and Humanities um, over the last 20 years. Um, it's a lot of information, but I just wanted to bring to your attention a couple of points. If you look at funding in FY07, it was the highest that it's ever been um, in, the, in the NDA appropriation. If you look at um, direct operating support administration and um, also direct grants for organizations, they had received $5.6 million. Um, and right now, uh, we're just at $4.5 me, million dollars in total grants. So our funding for the arts and humanities has not um, risen uh, to the levels that it was prior to the recession and um, they definitely could use continued support to begin to grow and continue to grow the organizations that are established as well as those that are coming up. So during um, this past budget season, um, the Arts and Humanities Council, they had requested that the county look at um, providing um, direct more autonomy to the Arts and Humanities Council to grant without the conditions that we set forth in the operating budget resolution. Um, on page five, I have a copy of the operating budget resolution language. As you can see, we provide um, support for operating grants for large organizations, as well as another, a number of project and program grants for small and mid-sized organizations and individuals. Then we also supplement that funding with advancement grants. There's funding for administration for the arts. We also support a arts and humanities matching fund and grants to Wheaton. In this year, you'll see one line added. It was $250,000 that we added for undesignated grants. And this was added to begin to address the need by Arts and Humanities Council to be able to grant without that condition. So they received this funding in this fiscal year and they've been able to apply those grants to organizations based on demand. Um, and it's gone to support a number of mid-sized organizations that ne haven't necessarily had that opportunity to get that funding in prior years. I just want to backtrack and look at um, the strategic plans and the funding categories that it outlined um, for, uh, for the Arts and Humanities Council. There was a strategic, strategic plan that was released in 2007. It um, laid out funding categories 
for the Arts and Humanities Council talked about um, funding for large organizations, and it um, the funding formula was based on eight to ten percent of their eligible um, budget expenses. However, you can see on that chart that that funding has not necessarily risen to that level. Um, it's been around five percent, five and a half percent since the inception of that strategic plan. Um, a new strategic plan was conducted, which a number of you have at your seat. Um, it was a five-year plan that was released in 2017 um, for 2017 through 22. And a number of new categories were created to begin to sort of address the changes that the Arts and Humanities Council has been seeing in their population. Um, operating support for mid-sized organizations was introduced with this strategic plan. Um, as well as um, breaking out the support um, grants for a number of small organizations and individuals. Um, <clears throat> and then also the council had added grants for the Wheaton Cultural Projects and then advancement grants were changed from add-on grants to advancement grants just to provide a little more clarification. Okay. So um, based on Arts and Humanities Council's recommendation or request to be able to grant without condition, um, that would move the council away from appropriating against the different um, categories that we outline in the budget appropriation and give them full autonomy to be able to award those um, granting dollars without the conditions that we set forth in that recommendation. It allows them more flexibility to be able to address the demand that they're seeing. Um, <clears throat> council staff had recommended during review of the budget that we didn't necessarily move toward that model at that time, but give the Arts and Humanities Council, as well as the various stakeholders in the community, an opportunity to talk about the changes that have been recommended and provide feedback on their thoughts and talk about the different needs that people are seeing in the community. Um, but looking forward, I think that it's important for the council to signal some sort of guidance on how they want the Arts and Humanities Council to move forward with their regranting efforts, especially when it comes to looking at the changes that they're seeing in the demographics in the sector. So I have recommended two options, which you'll find on page six, to sort of move towards um, getting Arts and Humanities Council closer to their request to grant without those conditions, but also provide some sustainability and assurance to a lot of the large organizations that um, have been the recipient of a large number of the grants over the years. Um, so the first recommendation that you see before you would retain the existing grant structure um, and provide base funding for the large organizations uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and also build upon the newly created undesignated grant appropriation line. Um, and you would have, you would have grants for large organizations, and then you would also have the grants for, op for program and project support for mid and small size organizations, individuals, advancement grants, and undesignated grants. Um, and the council would just review that annually when they receive the operating budget. Uh, the second, uh, the second um, recommendation that you have before you is to sort is to move towards collapsing a number of the smaller grant areas and just having an undesignated grant pool, but then also main, maintaining the category for the large organizations so that they would continue to have that line set out for operating support. And. If if there are any questions on that, I can answer those. Well, let me do this. Let me, at this point, give uh, Ms. Jenkins an opportunity from an Arts and Humanities Council perspective. Um, you've heard uh, what council staff has put before us. And again, we're not making decisions today. This is just a point of discussion for us to talk about. And of course, then I'm happy that Ms. Lambert is here from the county executive side, because certainly the county executive will play a key role in terms of helping us to shape what it is that we move in the future when it comes to funding for our arts uh, throughout the county. But Ms. Jenkins, let's hear from you in terms of what your thoughts are in terms of, now that you've had a budget to where you had what we would consider a quasi module of the first one where you had your base funding, if you will, that was set, but then had this undesignated uh, amount that 
the Arts and Humanities Council could uh, use to strategically uh, enhance uh, support for arts organizations. So I'll give you the floor to talk a little bit about what model you think may work best in the interests of our arts community. Thank you so very much. Thank you for um, hosting this work session today. I think it's really critical um, as we continue to do our work as the designated local arts council for the county and also to represent um, the sector that we come from, that we practice in. Um, so it's a wonderful honor to be able to do that and I appreciate the opportunity. I also want to thank Linda um, for her incredible work um, uh, this year and in prior years in really getting to understand and learn about our sector and learn what our sector's needs are and to be able to respond to that. I really appreciate that. Specifically, I appreciate her recommendations about um, uh, uh, this, this work session was to talk about removing granting restrictions from our, on our agency for the purpose of achieving appropriation policies and processes based on demand through an equity lens. So I think it's really important to say that I think we're all here for that same purpose. Um, and I appreciate um, her recommendation that our funding, AHCMC as your agent, our administration funding is funded through a separate category. That's worked and we'd like to continue that. Um, we also appreciated her recommendation of providing um, matching funds because we've seen that that's a great way to incentivize private dollars. It's worked quite well. And the combination of funds that have been raised um, through private sources, through the executive's ball in the past years, and through Power to Give have been quite impressive. Um, we've been quite impressed with the fact that Power to Give alone has been able to match about uh, $700,000 in funds. And so that's been really pretty exciting when you see that. And we appreciate her recommendation that um, Public Arts Trust be ramped up. Um, and we think that that's also a, a very good tactic. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that um, also as we talk about uh, arts in the schools and we talk about our relationship with MCPS, um, that um, uh, many of the public art general operating program and individual and uh, scholars grants we provide are used for programs that interface with MCPS. So while we're giving general operating support, say, to a large or mid-sized organization, they are using some of those general operating supports to intersect with MCPS. So we have that intersection already. And we also provide individual artists and scholars grants to artists and they too are intersecting with MCPS. So you'll see in my recommendations um, that I do support the idea that we, um, we look into this uh, database that Dr. Rump has recommended of, called Artlook. Uh, I spent some time investigating the database and I, I believe it'll work for us and I'll tell you why in a moment. So my comments are that the analysts provided two potential options to revise grant app appropriations and we acknowledge uh, and the community has asked for the equitable distribution of funds in three major areas. General operating support, which is very, very difficult to get outside of a government appropriation like ours. Project support and that would include capital improvement grants and support for individual artists and scholars. So while we appreciate the analysts propose options for funding, both options emanate from the framework of our current funding paradigm with threshold established over a decade ago during vastly different economic times. So, and neither addresses the capital improvement grant program. So under the current paradigm, um, uh, the general operating support for large organization categories with budgets of at least $150,000 are evaluated next to organizations with budgets of $12.4 million. And we know that that birth is just way too wide. And so um, we're asking for a couple of things. Um, we've reviewed the packet and we ask that the county council consider the county executive's recommendation for multi-year budgeting for the arts and humanities for the purpose of affording more financial and forecasting ability for our sector 
if not legislatively, then through new regranting policies and paradigms proposed by the Arts and Humanities Council, adopted by our board, recognized by the county, and implemented by the Arts and Humanities Council. So here, while legislatively it may be because we have a budget that's approved every year, if we form a base for organizations and guarantee that over two or three years they would be guaranteed that base given the appropriation. And then we were able to make any other budget fluctuations to their um, appropriation once we understood what the funds were. If they were guaranteed that number and that base over a two or three year period, it would stop budget fluctuations that often cause organizations to have these um, issues with cash flow and other issues in attracting other private and foundation and corporation grants. So a multi-year granting opportunity, like I say, if not legislatively, then through the policies that we develop, I think would really help um, bring a lot of um, capacity and stability to our sector. And we would ask that you would strongly consider that. Um, and with that, though, that we be given the autonomy with input from the community to recommend and implement new funding distribution paradigms. So, for example, as I said, we know that organizations just need basically three kinds of support, general operating program and then support for individual artists and scholars. But that general operating support and the organizations that we serve from budgets of 150 to budgets of 12.4 is, is wide. So we would de develop different benchmarks at different levels that recognized what capacity is for an organization of 150,000 versus, say, 15 million or something like that. And so there would be the general operating support, but it would, never, it would no longer be called general operating support for large organizations. It's just general operating support. And then we have these tiers for how organizations and what their base is, and then we go back to that multi-year funding, and you know, if you're performing well, you're allowed then to go for another cycle of multi-year funding. If you're not performing well for some reason or another difficult financials, then we go back to the year to year to help stabilize the organization and then move them again to multi-year funding to increase more stability for in the field. So, um, and that you continue that we, our, our third ask is that you continue funding our administration as the county's NDA in this sector as a separate care category, but adequate to support what we're seeing residents and the government's demand for equitable grant making, technical assistance, professional development and expertise. You know, what I've seen in the 11 years that I've been here um, is that we are called many times by different county offices saying, hey, I'd like either public art in my office or I'd like to put some public art on my property or I'm working with a developer who's doing something and can you come in and tell us how this is done? And so to do that, along with the grant making, along with the professional development, along with the technical assistance, requires administrative support and we hope that you would recognize it, that in order to bring our best selves to that um, we need that support um, and I should add that all of our senior leadership have tertiary degrees in this subject matter and we consider ourselves experts in the subject matter arena and we also have many on our board with tertiary degrees in art management or in art history um, or our artists themselves and so we bring to the table a lot of expertise that we're excited and willing to share with the community and often do um, from many different strategic points. So uh, again, I ask that the county continue providing matching funds. This incentive is really great when we say that we've got matching funds and we give it to organizations to use for power to give, that crowdsourcing um, um, tool that we implemented several years ago, we see that the de demand is just overwhelming and that people often get their matches. So it's been a great way to crowdsource. And the best thing about that is that whoever 
um, is a donor through that crowdsourcing website, those names and that contact information is turned over to the organization. So these are donors, you know, small donors that you may not know about that then you can put into your donor base that you can grow. So you might be able to grow someone from a $25 donor this year to a 50 and up and up and up and then bring them into your community in different ways. So this, is, this has been really fruitful and we've been happy to see that. Um, uh, we were only the second or third community to bring in Power to Give about six years ago or so, and um, I'm I'm really proud of the way that that tool tool has worked for us. Um, the um, Alice did not mention capital improvement grants, but um, I ask that the county continue to provide funding for capital improvement grants. It is a project fund. You know, so as I talk about general operating project and individual artists and scholars, this would be under the project grant, you know. So we have advancement grants, that's one kind of projects for technical assistance, and the other is capital improvement grants, and we need that to continue. It's not a constant. What I've seen is that demand often fluctuates there as I've monitored it over the years. Um, but when there's demand, there's demand, and by getting an advancement grant first to allow for the strategic planning for a capital project, and then getting the capital project, it allows organizations to plan out over a succession number, a successive number of years, how they might want to build uh, their capital assets. And uh, I would ask that you continue with that appropriation. Um, uh, you've heard me ask before, but I'll say again that it's imperative that the county ramp up funding for the Public Arts Trust to legislative funding levels. I'll say that the majority of the county's public art collection is in MCPS. And so um, our concern is that without sufficient funds to ma maintain and conserve and even commission um, new artwork right now, we have about 900 pieces in the county's collection about 600 works on paper that you just got uh, in the county council offices recently and about 300 works, three-dimensional works out in the public. Those three, a lot of those 300 works are in Randy schools. And so we wanna make sure that we have a sufficient amount of funding to maintain and conserve them. Some of them were bought, um, were bought in the 70s, so you can well imagine that they need conservation and maintenance and $90,000 to do that for a 900 piece collection is simply not enough. Um, and if we were getting to the legislative funding levels, we'd be closer to 300,000. So I'm asking that you strongly consider that. Um, and something that I have uh, heard from my colleagues in, um, in the county about the A&E districts is that there, we need a centralized coordinator. And so I'm asking that the county consider funding a full-time position for an arts and entertainment district coordinator. There is no one who's tying Wheaton and Bethesda and Silver Spring together. And at the state level, as I talk to my colleagues from the state, everybody shows up, but there's no coordinated voice. And for a county of our size, I feel like we need a coordinator for these A&E districts so that we can really figure out how to leverage that tax asset that we can afford people and figure out how we might use it as we consider building up um, certain areas that have been traditionally uh, underserved, such as that in Wheaton. And I would also say, as I think about Wheaton, that I'm so proud of the work that we've done in Wheaton with the Wheaton Cultural Grants. Those are project grants. And so how that would look if it fell just under project is that it may be in the way we have done from year to year with advancement grant when the economic downturn first happened, we said you could use the advancement grant to deal with emergent personnel issues that you might have for a short-term period. When we saw that that need diminished, then we said, okay, we're changing the need, and you can apply for technology to upgrade your technology after the downturn because people couldn't do that. Now we've, in, we've changed it once again to say you could use it for strategic plans or capital plans. So in the same way that we're able to adjust the criteria, say in advancement grants, we could adjust the criteria so that um, 
uh, as we look at the Wheaton grants, we can say you can apply for this grant if you have a special project in, the, in these traditionally underserved, underrepresented communities that do this, and some of those communities could be Clarksburg, Wheaton, and we could list those communities and have people apply to do projects just in those areas. So we can be really specific as we say, here's these different project grants that you could apply for. And uh, then last but not least, um, as I said, I believe that this Art Look tool that we've seen from our colleagues in Chicago, it's a tool that will help with data collection and mapping to increase arts education, access, equity, and quality in the county towards the goal of ensuring that every MCPS student in every grade in every school has access to the arts not only as part of a well-rounded education, but um, in pursuit of nurturing Montgomery County's creative workforce. And you know I'm always talking about how um, at preschool levels we begin nurturing a creative workforce by talking to kids about problem solving in ways that's creative and innovative. And the way to do that is through arts education and arts access. So I would strongly consider um, the investment of this tool just as though, just as the county helped with the investment of the Power to Give tool, we see that some of the technological tools can really help us get to the things that we want. Once we do the data mapping in MCPS through the Artlook tool, then we'll know what's happening where and what's not happening where. And what we want is that answer. What's not happening where? And then as I think about my grant programs and then that adjustment that I just talked to you about, this grant will be applicants who apply to do work in these schools will get first priority in grant consideration or whatever that verbiage is. Um, but it is a way we can move it around in ways that we see help us meet our goals um, in ways that I think is really strategic and thoughtful. And at the end of the day, um, that's where we'd like to go. So I guess overall, I'd say um, I hope that this reflects your understanding that we've spent a lot of time um, thinking about what we need to do in the community. One of the things that I'm asking is that we not make any decisions right now. My staff is working diligently to come up with draft guidelines that we will propose to the community. And before the county make a determination about um, whether or not to keep the old paradigm of general operating support, large organization, and then discretionary funds for the rest, give us an opportunity to kind of follow up on two years worth now of community conversations. We had conversations last summer and we asked them if the tool and the approach to grant making that we had worked. And overall, they said yes. Then we came back and we said, okay, now we've got this tool that you said works okay. And so now we wanna ask, what does equity mean to you? And we asked two questions in a survey and you saw those answers that I gave you during my hearing. And now we have spent a good portion of this summer with these community conversations. And we've asked, what is your cultural competency? What would equity for an organization mean to you? Um, what do you need? Um, and we've heard a lot from the community. We'd like the opportunity to now synthesize that into these new proposed guidelines and new funding paradigms that we'd like to propose, go out to the community, talk with the community about it, vet them with the community, and then come back, have our board approve, and then have you recognize those new guidelines rather than stand on an old paradigm. Those are my comments, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Jenkins. And before I turn to my colleagues, I just want to highlight one of the things that you said, because at the very beginning, you talked about um, making sure that we're focused on uh, granting with an equity lens. And I want to be sure that folks that, for uh, my colleague, Councilmember Juwando, for the millions that are watching at home and the uh, maybe almost 100 that are here in attendance, um, equity should not just be an exercise, it should be an evolution. Uh, and I want folks to understand that that is our expectation. Uh, it is one in which it is not just a process to put on paper and say what something may look like, but it's supposed to be who you are to become because we as a community have changed. 
And so therefore we expect organizations to change accordingly. And it's not just for the arts, it's for every single organization led by our council president who has tasked our entire county government with going in that direction and echoed by our county executive uh, who is incredibly supportive and has the same mindset. And so I wanna be very clear with folks that unless you have the true intention that you are going to evolve and change yourself into an equitable model, it will not work for you. I just wanna be very clear about that. It will not work um, because we in the council, uh, we in the community, uh, those that are decision makers are looking for that. And we are going to support mechanisms that continue to foster that mindset and that change, that evolution. Um, I will say that I gave this a lot of thought and I didn't talk to as many arts organizations, of course, as uh, you did, Ms. Jenkins, but I had large organizations come into my office. Uh, many of you know who you are. Uh, and I had medium and small size organizations come into my office and talk about uh, some of these different kinds of models and what uh, would make sense for you moving forward. Let me just be very clear um, that I said that I did not want to see anyone lose their established funding. And so I, as an individual council member, want to be clear that when it comes to base funding, we understand how hard it is to survive in the arts community. We understand it's incredibly difficult. It is not easy. And it continues to become more and more of a challenge as our society, unfortunately, moves away from some of the traditional models in which they incorporate and accept the arts and go into different mediums. Uh, and, and, and so it, it, it certainly is something that is difficult. But at the same time, uh, I feel as though we need to be looking to folks who are innovating uh, and really doing things very differently about how they can continue to reach some of our harder to reach communities. I will just say, as I do oftentimes as we have these council sessions, just look around the room. Look to the right of you and the left of you. And does this room look like what we see in Montgomery County? And if it doesn't, we all, not just the folks that are sitting at the table, but us up here are still not getting where we need to be when it comes to our engagement and involvement of our communities. That is the reason why we have charged ourselves with this equity lens. We see it at public hearings, and this is no different from any other public hearing to where I mentioned to my colleagues how I wish that this room looked like what I see when I go out into my neighborhoods, like what I see when I go to the grocery store or when I go to the mall or to the library. And that says something about how we still need to do more. We need to do more work. And that work requires money as well. And so I am certainly one who has said that, look, if you want to see some of that change, it's gotta be a willingness on the folks to be able to make the change, but it's also gotta be you willing to support the folks in making that change because it costs money. It is not just simply something you can turn a switch and say, okay, now things are done and everything's rosy and uh, everybody's included and everybody feels valued and we've outreached to everyone doesn't happen that way. Um, and I understand that, and I think my colleagues do as well. And so from that perspective, that's why we uh, put half a million dollars on the reconciliation list for additional arts funding this past budget year. We could only get $250,000 off of that reconciliation list due to budget constraints that we had, but that was a sizable investment and a down payment in terms of making sure that we were clear to the arts community, we were serious about our conversation. We want to see arts thrive in Montgomery County. We also wanna make sure that we set you up for success in terms of thriving by ensuring that those are tied to the same sorts of priorities that we have, that we're seeing are going to be uh, successful in our community. I wanna to turn to my colleagues to see if they have any comments about these particular issues because these are at the forefront. Again, as you said, Ms. Jenkins, we are not, and as I said at the beginning, we are not making decisions today, but I certainly want this to be a dialogue and I want people to know that this is the beginning of a discussion about what we can do about changing how we 
support the arts in Montgomery County um, and the direction that we head in. And so I'm going to turn to my council president and then to council member Duando and then to some of our visitors that may have comments as well. Council President Navarro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I do appreciate this conversation. I think that it's not in isolation. Um, we definitely have been involved in looking at um, the different ways in which we are uh, delivering uh, services and also supporting what is of value um, here in the county with a brand new administration and a brand new council. It really is, I think, a, a, a very auspicious opportunity to do that throughout. And um, I think that uh, I'm, I'm inspired by how many jurisdictions across the country are doing similar things, are, are engaging in this exercise of trying to understand how we can, number one, leverage our resources, and number two, um, making sure that every single aspect that county government can support um, can actually um, be done through this lens of ensuring that all our residents are taken advantage. So I'm really excited about opportunities to uh, expand, if you will, the pot and leverage uh, those dollars. I'm really excited, um, Ms. Jenkins, you mentioned, um, you know, Wheaton in particular, uh, as there are opportunities emerging for even more robust um, you know, arts and entertainment uh, opportunities there with maybe an arts and cultural center. Uh, so I think that in, in general, this is, we may have some water somewhere. <laughs> oh, okay. I think that in general, um, it's just a really, it's, it's a really important moment. Um, and this whole notion of how do we expose our children and our young people to arts and, and humanities opportunity is also really critical. Um, there we go. We got somebody on the rescue here. <coughs> yeah. Um, and particularly in light of what we see time and time again in our public school system where it's so difficult, you know, they always say we, sh we, we wish we had more time during the day, more hours to provide exposure to the arts for our young people. Um, and we also see how with a lot of particular areas of our county where we may not have as much of a robust presence of um, arts and, and humanities. Um, we, need to, we need to work on that as well. So I don't see this as a um, difficult exercise. I see this as a great opportunity to be as creative as possible um, in order for us to leverage funding, leverage resources, and also figure out how we can expand. I um, think I mentioned um, once publicly about this really awesome opportunity I had to attend this event at the Sandy Spring Museum, and it was a Cultura Plena, which is an Afro-Puerto Rican uh, workshop um, where you learn about the history and the tradition of this very important um, sort of folkloric uh, tradition in Puerto Rico. Um, I kind of went because I love live drums and I thought, oh, this is a great way to exercise, kind of like a Sumba, but with like a lot of traditional and information. Uh, but you know, I was so stunned to see over, I think there were like 100 people uh, there. And when the director of the Sunday Spring Museum said how many people are here for the first time, I would say that about 85% of the people raised their hand. So it was awesome to be able to utilize, you know, this type of very traditional um, live drumming, you know, cultural, um, wonderful movement uh, to bring in also to the museum uh, new people. And so we have so much capacity out there, um, and I'm, I really do look forward to working with the arts community, with you, uh, to support how we then really shift our thinking. It is, we say all the time, the county has changed so much. It has, yeah, it has changed a lot. Um, but you know, this change has been happening for a long time. And so to the extent that we're working to provide access on all kinds of different policy areas, um, this particular one, I think more than ever, is gonna be super important um, to provide that access to our communities because there is a lot of tension and um, concern um, pain, fear in many corners of our communities, and the arts um, always provides 
that mechanism, that vehicle to sometimes express things that you just can't verbalize. And so for me, it's really an, an, an awesome, I think, opportunity. And I, I, I do like, you know, these, these possible um, recommendations and look forward to fleshing them out a little bit more in order to see where we can land. So really appreciate the opportunity to have this, this conversation. Thank you very much, Madam President. I'm going to turn to uh, my colleague on the committee first, uh, Councilmember Jawando, and then Councilmember Albernos. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and good to see everybody, uh, both on the dais and testifying and in the audience. A um, couple questions on what you just presented, Susan, uh, and I'm glad we got you water. If you need more, let us know. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I, I had to speak at an event last week, and I, I was fine until I had to speak, <coughs> and, I, and I had to cough every two seconds. I just it don't just know what happened. Like that sometimes. The, I think the air in here is kind of dry. I agree. Um, so working my way backwards, you mentioned mm -hmm. the, the full-time arts and entertainment coordinator, which I, I've heard that idea before, from, and I think it's a good one. Could you talk about, uh, it, you know, we have obviously Visit Montgomery, which is, marketing the overall county and arts being a part of that. Do you, do you envision that in person or in, would work with you or what's the, did you have a specific proposal? Well, uh, I do. Okay. Um, uh, bottom line, that person would work with us to for work you? because, for me. For the council. Yes, okay. for the Arts and Humanities Council uh, to help with the coordination of the A&E districts because I am the county's direct report for the Arts Council to the state, and the A&E districts are a state construct that we have mm -hmm. here in the county. And so to, to us, it makes sense that we would help coordinate those conversations about the arts that also intersect with the grant making that we're doing. Sure. Okay. So there we could find out what other needs there may be right now the needs in the Wheaton AD, a and &E district are much heavier than, say, that of Bethesda, which is a more mature a and &E district. So when we're, if we're thinking about those three kids looking for equity, <clears throat> I see that coordinator being able to look at the fence, see who needs the taller box, and then to provide whatever resources to that particular community in order so, so that our three A&E districts are operating differently but at, at similar levels. And that person could also obviously work with other county funded or uh, related entities that care about arts and entertainment and kind of coordinate them as well. Right. Yeah. To be specific, um, I'll tell you this. Uh, that the county consider funding a full-time uh, FTE position at AHCMC for an arts and entertainment district coordinator to build on the county's various arts and entertainment districts, promoting each unique urban district as a destination. Duties would include organize, organizing a broad network of local residents to promote each urban district as a destination for arts and cultural activities assisting with Montgomery County's urban district events where arts training and or arts education expertise may be necessary. Encouraging our constituents to engage in best practices in community building. Aiding in programming a diverse mix of, art, of arts related cultural events countywide and especially in the A&E districts and in public spaces and providing arts consulting services to other departments and agencies within the government. That's, one, that's great. And I'm, if that's in my packet, forgive me, I didn't see that. But It's uh, not. Okay. Right, there we go. Good. okay. It is my response okay. to uh, Linda's packet that I developed over the weekend. Yeah, good. But uh, you should know that a few years ago, we did propose to answer a procurement proposal asking for a coordinator. We did not win that proposal, but our thought behind it remains the same, that when I talk to my A&E colleagues, they say, yeah, we're doing stuff, but there's not any, yeah. there's no, nothing that brings, that binds us together, and we go to the state individually, and then we may learn what each one is doing. And I don't think that that presents the most cogent view of how we're handling the sector in our county. I agree, and, that, and thank you. That's very helpful, and I, I look forward to seeing that and hearing more about that that uh, proposed position. Um, 
to the point of the larger question we're trying to answer here of and obviously we we were able to add the half the quarter million dollars in undesignated which is great and it's going to give you some flexibility going forward obviously we have to answer this question of the larger issue what's presented in the packet and what you clearly made your preferences you said you're going to come back to us and if you give me a sense of the timeline with some some how it would work or more meat on the bones could you describe yeah that a i would more? i would say that we would come back to you somewhere around the end of september first part of october we are now getting all this feedback, looking at this concept of general operating program individual and saying, okay, you know, what's the threshold if you're a $5 million, this is just hypothetical, sure. this is not determined yet. If you're an X million dollar organization between X and Y, what's that base? between Y and Z, what that might be, would that work? Is there some other way to do that? And so now we're looking, but the major, what we've seen overall is like, yes, we want equity. Yes, we want definitely want general operating support. Sometimes we need program support. Sometimes we need emergent funds. We need it quickly and we need a reduction in paperwork. <clears throat> so as, so all of my, all of my ideas are um, at least theoretically are presented today with the idea that we would reduce barriers to participation, reduce uh, unnecessary paperwork, increase productivity, and aid in capacity building. I appreciate that update. Uh, one of the things that's obviously, you, I think you've heard from the committee, and I'm certainly, as you see, of having so many other council members here, we, all, we care greatly about the arts. I was very excited that as a new council member that education was going to be it's added, beautiful. culture was going to be added, it's beautiful. Uh, and we have the opportunity. And as uh, Ms. Price outlined at the beginning of the packet, you know, funding has not recovered. You know, we're, right. we're below at our the high of 10 plus years ago, and so we need to continue to head in the right direction to increase the larger pot yes. for everybody. And I think we're all in unison on that. Obviously, anytime you have a discussion of reallocation of resources, as we are having in the United States of America about where do people get money and who gets what and, and that's always a difficult conversation because it's yeah. going to it has the potential to change what has been happening uh, to what is a new formula but I think if we keep those principles that we want to increase the pie we want to make sure that there is a, a fair and transparent and real process going forward that includes community input of all organizations uh, which you've you know done and continue to do and I encourage you to c continue to do um, I think we can land in a good place. So I, I'm eager, I would be eager to review your proposal. And obviously those would be guidelines, I assume. That there's not a hard and fast, there, there could be exceptions to this process, to this, this uh, chart that you described potentially. Well, they're guidelines. <clears throat> and once the guidelines are established and publicly posted, then they are there to ensure equity. Right. So um, just as we follow the guidelines now, when we have an organization that falls out of the guidelines, then we do have ways to address it, but hopefully we don't have to make too many exceptions right. because our goal always is equity, right. um, but through a practical lens so that we can make certain that we're not throwing the proverbial baby out with the bathwater. Correct. Correct. No, I, I think that's important. Thank you for clearing that up. And then the, the, I had a question of the county executive's representation. Uh, do you uh, you have anything to add? Or am, I, am I going? Yeah, I just on, on this part. You want me to pause on that? All right, we're going to wait on that. And okay. I'll, so to, to be continued. So I'll come back. All right. Um, thank you, Ms. Jenkins. You're welcome, and thank you. All right. I, I do want to give the uh, county executive uh, staff a chance to kind of give their vision, Ms. Kasiri and to Ms. Lambert, to see where they are. But I did want to give my colleagues first an opportunity to weigh in on what they've heard from Ms. Jenkins first, and then we'll go back to the county executive's thoughts. Ms. Jenkins, you were just about to say something. I was just saying that I'm looking at Council Member um, Albernos, who for this is going into my 11th year, so 10 of my 11 years has been the department to which my agency has reported. And I think that, <clears throat> I'm not sure what you'll say, but I'd say that one of the things that we also see as important is that over the years we've had a synergistic but not opportunistic 
relationship with the Department of Recreation. And I'd say that I think we could have the opportunity to do a better job of that um, because there's so many great things happening in the Department of Recreation, as there are with many other departments. But just to have the opportunity to speak with department heads and others so that we can help use, um, uh, not use, uh, what's leverage the arts and humanities as a good solution to challenges we may have in communities. I just want to, I just want to say that that's something that we're always striving for. I will just say that you had no idea, but that's a perfect segue because Councilmember Abernos, you're up next. Thank you, <clears throat> Susan. It's great to see you. Um, it's great to see you too. So I've got a lot to say, but I'm going to try to be concise because, as you said, I've got 12 years of knowledge in this brain up here that I'm going to try to synthesize. But for a little bit of context, so I was uh, in the room oftentimes when name the organization, large, medium, or small, uh, face some crisis financially that required the county to make some additional layer of investment to help support its ongoing operating efforts. And just a few observations through that process. Number one, um, there was a deep, deep, deep impact as a result of the recession because the discretionary income on um, a number of our county residents went by the wayside. And so it was especially hard uh, to maintain the level of support of these incredible arts-based organizations because people just were not in a position to be able to take advantage of the incredible arts opportunities that we have here in Montgomery County. So I want to underscore um, that, that we're still not out of that, those woods. Uh, the fact that we are still not, we're, we're still pre-recession contributions to Arts and Humanities Council even though our county government, our county as a whole has grown by 20%. Uh, since since when this last happened. So that just underscores this is a long-standing challenge um, that, that has been out there. A couple of other observations. Um, for a long time, there was a discussion or an interest in having the Arts and Humanities Council report to the Fed Committee because of the incredibly important link to economic development. We will never have enough resources in the county to underwrite the cost of all of the growing needs that we have here. And so we are going to need to be more intentional and strategic about developing private level support uh, to help reinforce and expand arts to get them to where they can and should be. Um, I have visited Austin, Texas numerous times because of a leadership program that I participated in a couple of years ago. And there is great investment from within the city of Austin from their private sector, acknowledging that it's a way to attract millennials. It's a way to really leverage the wonderful benefits of that community. And I know, Ms. Jenkins, you and I have had many conversations about that city and others like it very specifically. And so I very much support for example, the notion of somebody being a coordinator for our arts and entertainment districts, which I do believe could be more intentional about trying to provide more public-private partnerships with our private sector. Um, I, I also want to say uh, to Councilmember Rice's point earlier, and I, I think he's right, from, certainly from a moral perspective, it's important for all of our organizations within the county to reflect the diversity of the communities that we're trying to serve, but my goodness, it makes economic sense too, uh, particularly now. Um, and so I think that as we're all adjusting to this beautiful diversity that we have here in Montgomery County, uh, it's incumbent upon all organizations and institutions to do their best to keep pace with the very diversified needs and interests of our communities. Um, because when you look at the sort of the constellation of arts-based organizations in Montgomery County. It is a beautiful constellation. We have, the fact that we have large, medium, and small organizations is no small thing. And people for many decades now have fought and worked hard uh, to raise the private sector dollars and philanthropic dollars to advocate before this and previous councils and previous county executives to make us one of the destination spots nationally for such a strong constellation. Our arts and humanities is our soul in so many different ways, but they all, this constellation has to work collaboratively and together. You can't have one without the other. 
And so I think we're all committed to growing the pie, whether it be through, um, if possible, adding resources through the county's budget process, although that is not looking great in the near or long term, but also leveraging private and philanthropic dollars to meet us closer to the middle so that we can grow the entire pie. And I know there's anxiousness uh, from the arts and humanities community, um, anxiousness from smaller organizations that want to meet the growing need, anxiousness from medium-sized organizations that are just struggling financially and struggling to make payroll and, and really worried about the landscape of the current federal administration, and struggles of large organizations too, uh, who have significant capital needs that are unique, who have you know significant operating needs, particularly with relation to having employees uh, represented by labor that are unique. So I think that um, the starting point is a really good one and a really authentic one. And I, I think we're going to arrive in an even better place than we are now. I'm confident of that because this council is committed to making sure all orts-based organizations move forward um, and that we don't leave anybody behind. Um, but we are gonna have to, to, to be very creative in the manner in which that we address those needs. Last plug is for the Public Arts Trust, which man, if I could have said amen while you were talking, I would have said amen. Um, this is an area that I have a lot of experience with, and this is a terrible story, but at the Germantown Recreation Center, we had a summer camp member who was impaled uh, in his leg uh, from one of the public arts that had gone in a state of disarray in front of the community center. And we worked to try and find the gentleman who was the curator of that art who had passed away. And there wasn't enough funds and to, to be able to address the, the needs. Now that is an extreme example, obviously, thank goodness. Um, but there are other incredibly impor important pieces of public art um, that don't have the resources that they need to be able to, to maintain them to a standard that we, we would all find important. Um, and so I do think that's an area that, that requires additional levels of investment. Um, and that's another area that, that very much we, we need to focus on. But um, those are just some opening comments. I don't have questions yet because obviously as we get further along in our deliberations, uh, and, and I am very curious as to hear from the executive branch to hear um, the county executive's uh, area and, and, and what he's thinking in terms of our, our arts community and, and how we can work collaboratively moving forward. But um, that's it for now. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Albernos. Uh, Councilmember Freeton. Thank you uh, to uh, Chair Rice for convening this, for allowing those of us who aren't on the committee to participate. It's obviously such an important uh, issue for all of us, for the county, for our uh, many objectives that we have. The arts are such an important part of it, and I think Councilmember Albernaz said it uh, extremely well. I, I think it was a really good packet, and thank you to Linda Price for your uh, work on this, and uh, thank you to the Arts and Humanities Council for your feedback and for all of your hard work. I, I think uh, where my uh, large uh, focus on this is kind of getting out of this false choice that we seem to be discussing this issue uh, about, and Councilman Rauernas hinted at this, but um, it's not in, it, it, we have to get, you know, out of the, the less um, or and more and, and I really do think that needs to be part of the, the uh, conversation and not necessarily a, a large versus small, but a question of how do we raise all of the organizations uh, that we have, because you know, when it comes to arts, it's just like economic development. It's it's not an either or situation. A successful and thriving arts community is like a successful and thriving economy. It has an ecosystem of different types of organizations that serve different types of needs of varying size. And when it works well, the large organizations support the small organizations, and the small organizations support the large ones. And sometimes the small organizations become the large. Uh, the large ones, and if you're not continuously innovating and have the uh, ability to be nimble like small businesses and small arts organizations do and be creative and have different approaches, uh, then you can't keep pace with new trends to the extent that you'd like. But if you don't have the large institutional backbone organizations that are there you know, over the course of, uh, of decades, you don't, you, you don't have 
uh, the type of community that you would want or the type of uh, support that you would want. So I hope that as we have this conversation, we uh, get out of the uh, the trap, I suppose, that we seem to find ourselves in where uh, it becomes a different buckets and those buckets are competing against each other for a finite amount of uh, resources because I think it's unhelpful to everybody, including uh, and especially each of those arts organizations because it really isn't this false choice of us versus them. And, uh, it's, and to me, it's not a question of viewing the arts as an economic development opportunity or uh, an equity opportunity. They're you know, one and the same, and they should be uh, you know, part of a broader goal. And as you know, Council Member Albert has mentioned, that you know, there is an economic development imperative to equity, and there's an equity imperative uh, to economic uh, development. And I think that if when we start to have the conversation of are we focusing on one, are we not focusing on the other, what should be uh, the focus, we lose the broader uh, point that the rising tide should lift all boats and we want to support the arts and we want to uh, create uh, uh, support for the arts. And, you know, with that, it, you know, the, the, the premise, or at least some of what it, you know, some of the conversation sometimes to me devolves into uh, small organizations, you know, are supporting equity or are, are in, in areas where there are underserved populations and some of the larger organizations aren't. And I think it, we lose some of the really great stories and the really great programs that we have that are serving these you know, tremendous goals. Thinking of you know, East County Strings uh, that, uh, at Strathmore and Bloom and uh, Step Africa and uh, at Imagination Stage they have Oyame that uh, the council president and council member Navarro, uh, the council member, council member Navarro uh, and council member you know, Albernaz were, uh, you know, led the way on that with telling the story of, of refugees through art, uh, and is a tremendous uh, uh, program uh, that we have. The fact that you know, 8,000 uh, Title One students are served in. Uh, in, in, in Strathmore at Glen Echo, I was up, I actually stepped in for the uh, auctioneer extraordinaire, Craig Rice, who uh, had a wedding and uh, I uh, stepped in as ably as I could. Fortunately, I had Catherine Leggett next to me, so I was kind of just uh, garnish, uh, so to speak. But uh, we raised uh, you know, $25,000 at their gala specifically for transportation and scholarships to programs to provide access. And you know, to me, it was particularly symbolic given Glen Echo's background uh, of who was and who wasn't included uh, at Glen Echo. And so we have some of these world-class uh, institutions uh, and world-class places where I think we should be using magnets to attract as many people as we can and have them be a key part uh, of the equity conversation and help to support our um, our other smaller, newer uh, organizations, but it shouldn't be a, an us versus them. We do this all the time, and this isn't unique uh, to arts. I have it, uh, I, I, it reminds me of the conversation that sometimes we run into when I go to an aging adult event, and they talk to me about how we should spend less money on schools and more money on programs that serve seniors, and I make the case that having a thriving education system helps seniors. And I think the same is true here. And so um, I'm glad we're having this conversation. I'm glad we're having a more thoughtful uh, and intentional uh, discussion of how we are going to increase funding for the arts, which everybody supports, uh, what that is going to mean, how we're gonna be intentional uh, about it, and how we're gonna uh, make sure that we're focused uh, in a transparent way that all the stakeholders uh, who are impacted are part of this conversation as the, you know, reading the packet as the previous discussions of the, the, what was it, the 2007 strategic plan and then uh, the most recent uh, strategic plan. You know, there are lots of conversations that went into that because you know, the funding for a lot of these organizations are existential, as many people in this room uh, can, uh, can attest. And so I'm hopeful that we continue this conversation, that everybody who uh, needs to be part of the conversation uh, has a, a seat at the table and that we keep growing that table, and in so doing, we keep growing our support uh, for the arts that lifts everybody up and doesn't pit uh, one organization against another. So I'm gonna turn to Councilmember Reamer, but uh, Councilmember Friedson, I just, uh, I, I, in sharing this meeting, I haven't heard anybody say anything about small versus larger, 
small versus mid or mid versus large, any of those kind of conversations. I'm sure maybe that's happening out in the community in some conversations, but here with the policymakers and the decision makers, I want to be very clear, that has never been a part of our decision making. It's been about strategically who needs the assistance and who has the best ideas about how to outreach to our community to provide even more access to the arts. And that's always been the leading mechanism. That's been the mechanism that since I have taken over and chairing this committee, but even before me, my predecessor, uh, Councilmember Leventhal, who led this, there never was that conversation about pitting one versus another. With finite resources, unfortunately, that oftentimes is the case. Um, and with a set amount of money, there are folks who are fighting for that set amount of money. And then you have those kind of internal struggles. Uh, but the reality is this, is that as we continue to, and I think at the end, with you saying that as we continue to increase funding as a whole, I do agree that those uh, will help all. The challenge is who gets the additional funding. And that still will lead to that sort of, you know, people will have to make their case. And we have to be real about this in the sense that it's not going to be just a percentage that we just spread amongst everybody. Everybody gets, you know, 2% of the, you know, uh, 250,000 additional dollars and, you know, everybody goes on because that's really not what we want. That's not equity. Um, that's equality. And so I just want to be very clear that there will be decisions that are made that will have, quote unquote, you know, winners and losers. Uh, the reality is, is that those, lose, those folks who don't have additional will still be kept at those levels under the kind of proposal that Ms. Price has laid out. And this, again, is not, we're not, you know, opining on anything here. We're just kind of analyzing uh, what's been presented to us. And we'll certainly have the benefit of what happens when uh, Ms. Jenkins meets with the community again to flush out this model even further. Uh, but I did want to say that because I don't want to set up this false sense of something that's not going to happen. With finite resources, there will always be a continued battle about who gets what. Just like you said, it happens in economic development when it comes to economic development support. I promise you there are businesses out there that uh, say, hey, I need more uh, and can justify why it is that they need more. Um, but there are others where we've decided it's a priority, whether it's biotech, whether it's uh, our life sciences, um, to where we've put in incentive in those areas because we want to see growth. Uh, it might mean that our mom and pop store, you know, or a Cafe Milano in Germantown shuts its doors. It happens. And it's unfortunate, but it's the reality. And so there will continue to be those kinds of things that happen. But at the end of the day, um, we are going to try and do our best to ensure that everybody has a piece of the pie. And then at the end of the day, there will some, be some people who get a little bit of the whipped cream topping. So with that, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Reamer. Getting hungry. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> We all want to have our pie and eat it too. There you go. So I, I said Any more? I said yeah. So. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, uh, you know, a few disparate threads first. Um, I, I, I'm very enthusiastic, enthusiastic about the idea of uh, strengthening the staff support for the cultural placemaking arts engagement in, in Wheaton, in Silver Spring, in parts of the county that have the ability to really uh, present more arts engagement to the community. Um, you know, there's a really strong growing arts community in Wheaton and uh, I think we need to be doing a lot and for the Arts and Humanities Council to be part of that at the table supporting that would be terrific. Um, I think that we need to really kind of reinvent how we handle all of that uh, in Wheaton but also Silver Spring. So. Uh, that's an interesting proposal. Um, you know, I, I wanted to come today just because it's been, th th there's been a sense of confusion and anxiety around this topic. And, um, you know, on the one hand, assurances, on the other hand, not so much assurances. I, I don't, I don't really know where exactly we are, uh, but I, I just wanted to come today and, and just be here to say I'm, I want to participate in this process and, and follow along and, 
uh, and so that I can cast my vote in a way that is educated and informed. Um, I, you know, I, I had a meeting with uh, Strathmore recently um, to talk about their program. I looked at their catalog. I saw a substantial number of performers from uh, different communities of color, from different global communities. Um, Susan, can I ask you just to comment? There's, there's this unstated thing that somehow some of the larger organizations are not meeting goals of racial equity. Can you, can you help me understand you know, what I'm hearing? Because that's, that's what I, th I feel like I'm hearing, but I don't know if that's really what is meant, people mean to say. Thank you for the question. I think that there's a lot of organizations that are doing a lot of really great things. I have been so excited to see how, as this conversation, this international conversation has taken wings, that our community and the grant seekers that we support have taken it to heart. And we are excited and encouraged to see that happen. So in 2010, when I first came in, and the 2010 census came out, and Montgomery County was considered to be a term I hate, but a term that's used federally, majority, minority community, it authenticated with what many of us in the community knew, and that was that this was largely a community of color. But at that time, in 2010, I did not see that reflected in the programming that our grant seekers were providing. Some were trying, but I wouldn't say it was the majority. In those nine years, though, there has been a sea change overall in the residents, the audiences, and the productions that our organizations have presented. Organizations that are doing well have done well by looking into those communities and programming to audiences that would get the butts and seats that they need to sell the tickets. And so what I've seen is that there has been a very good response to what the community needs. I wouldn't say that it's we're there yet, but I don't know any community in America that can say we're there. If we were there, we wouldn't have the conversations that we're having on Pennsylvania Avenue right now. But I would say that I'm not exactly sure where the fear is coming from, because if you're doing it, you're doing it and you know it. And so I think that for us, what we've said is that based on the resolution, the racial equity resolution, and the directive in that resolution that county contracts and the work that's done with the county would be done through this lens, we've said to our grantees, if you're not there already, you should get there. And so we've provided some tools. We've been able to um, share opportunities with our applicants so that they can get training in understanding how to better um, do a budget narrative that shows how their budget responds to the community needs. We've been able to help them get support so that they can help discuss and share stories of impact. As I said at our listening sessions, stories plus data equals impact. And so when we say, what's the impact on your community? When the community says, I was changed as a result of your programming, that's really just stupendous. And so we're asking, and we've said, we're gonna ask more questions in order to respond to our contract with the county. We're gonna be asking more con questions about how, if the community looks like this, how are you serving that? And if you're not, what are your goals to serve the community from whom, whose taxes support the work you do? And so if you're an organization that's not doing that, then I can understand how one might be nervous. That's why we went out and we sought 
to get funding from the CAFRITS Foundation, which we've now alerted the community to, so that if you don't understand what you might be able to do, we're offering training in the fall that will help people understand how to address some of these challenges with representing more diverse communities in one's own organization. So I am not certain where the fear is coming from. We've tried to be very explicit in our communication about why we're doing what we're doing and what's being done. We've tried to be explicit in the open air panels that we have when we talk about making sure that programming reflects the community that you're trying to serve. And we're continuing to try to help people understand that it's a new day and that taxpayers and local administrators and state and federal government are all asking the question, if you say you're, you're serving the community and your community is diverse, show us how you are serving them and why. And is it because you think you're offering up what they want or are they telling you what you want, what they want and you're responding to it? So I feel pretty optimistic because we've had a very reasoned public approach to how we're going about things. And if there is fear, then I think it's because people may not be asking us directly. But everything that I'm telling you today, we've stated publicly and will continue to do so because our role and our goal is to continue to stabilize build the community through an equity lens, and destabilization isn't anywhere on our radar. Thank you. I, mean, I think the, some of the issue, I'm sure, is about stability and organizations that uh, want to be able to be confident that the county is going to be able to support them. I, I think it may also be that some groups feel like their efforts aren't recognized, uh, you know, that, that their programming is targeting an audience that would seem to be, uh, you know, what you're speaking to, but they're not, for some reason, maybe that's not counting. Or, I don't know, I think about Roundhouse, which is doing an entire season just of women playwrights. Yeah. You know, that's pretty groundbreaking, pretty powerful. I think they're feeling like, how do, how do they know that that counts? Money talks, and if you get a score when your grant um, application is being evaluated, and if you score above the mean, which is our publicly posted guidelines, you get a financial reward. And so our feeling is that, yeah, I could come there and say, hey, you did great, or you could get a financial award of twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And so our feeling has been, since our capacity to say, hey, you did great for everything that, every, that the 500 organizations um, and 2,000 individual scholars that we serve, um, since we can't show up, since there's only eight of us and we can't show up everywhere, we figured that the best way to do it is to put plans in place so that if you are doing stellar work, you're rewarded and the reward comes to you in a place that you can really use it, which is your pocketbook. So this is the part of the grant formula, essentially? It's how, yes. how successfully you meet the Evaluative criteria. Evaluative criteria. Is that in the, did we get that information today? That information is posted on our website, and it says that if an organization scores above the mean, then they are, um, have the opportunity to receive a um, bonus based on that performance. They know that. Okay. Um. Well, I'll take a look at that. All right. Well, um, again. And the organizations you've mentioned, they have been recipients of that financial reward. Okay. Well, um, good to hear. I, I think there was some kind of communication breakdown, perhaps, or relationship breakdown I, I don't know I have you a know. great relationship I would I think I have a good relationship with Olney I sat next to Monica during our recent listening sessions and uh, I, and I just saw Jason over the weekend at 
Tiger style, and I see Ryan Roulette in the parking lot every day. So they've never approached me and said, we're not feeling love. Uh, and if they don't feel love, then, you know, perhaps it's more than I can provide. But my feeling is that my position allows me to be in a place to do the best work in the sunlight with equity. And the way that we do that is by publicly posting how one would be rewarded for excellent performance and then doing that. And we do that. All right. Thank you for uh, responding to those questions and helping to clarify the issues. And thank you. We'll continue thank you very much. Following along. Thank you. So before I turn to the uh, council president uh, for uh, her last remarks or comments, before I turn to the county executive, let me try and clear something up because I think that, again, maybe there's a little bit of uh, confusion as to what it is that we talk about uh, when we talk about equity versus equality. And there have been a number of examples that are cited about how folks are doing such a great job. So let me just give you my thoughts. Again, I'm one council member, happen to fortunately be the chair of the Education and Culture Committee, but let me just give you a little bit of an idea. You host Step, Step Africa, which I'm a big fan of at Strathmore, in relation to the fact that you had uh, Dvorak doing a symphonic, uh, and you had a symphonic performance with that. Great, that's equality. That's having the balance of having something that speaks to one community and another that speaks to another community. And there are cross sections, of course, right? I, mean, I like classical music, I like Greek, I like, you know, you know those, those things are great for me because I grew up, partially because I grew up here in Montgomery County. And so it's easy for me, you know, having a, little bit of the the exposure that not a lot of people uh, do, you get to be able to experience and then appreciate those kinds of things. But it still is equality. That's equality. That's just saying I have a balanced program. I have some program that speaks to, and then we throw in a little Latin youth dance, and so we have that there. And so, you, have, you know, that's equality. You have a little bit of something for everyone. Equity is when you go to a school like Watkins Mill and you say, hey, you've got a STEP team. Why don't you work with this great organization, STEP Africa, and come out on stage with us for a performance because what that's going to do is be a game changer. That's gonna change those kids' lives. They are gonna say that they performed on Strathmore stage with professionals who do the same thing that they do and that they can aspire to be that and be those professional performers and know that there's a career pathway associated with that, that, my friends, is equity. So I just wanna be very clear about where the differences and nuances are in terms of what equity and equality are. It's great to have equality, don't get me wrong. Equality is needed, that's the step to equity. But I'm gonna tell you right now, if you're really trying to get to equity, it's thinking outside of the box. It's doing what Imagination Stage did. And yeah, now I'll call them out. Uh, because in working with Street Outreach Network and doing something like that is completely different and putting formerly incarcerated people on the stage. Oh my God, that's unheard of. But guess what? It works so well and it works so well for everyone. That's equity. That's it. It's not that hard. And it's not my job, and it's not Susan's job to make you think about what equity is for your particular organization. That's you and your board's job. That's what you should charge them with. If they're not giving you the ideas about how to achieve equity, get them off your board, because they're not helping you. I'm telling you, this is something that makes a lot of sense that a lot of people have seen is successful. You know, I'm gonna make a lot of friends and a lot of enemies today, but I believe as though it's incredibly important to be real and to put it out there so that people understand and appreciate what it is that folks are asking for in our community. And they're asking for a place at the table. The place at the table is not that I can go and see someone who looks like me up on the stage. The true equity, when we talk about that picture you know, and I, I, I did a presentation on this on equity for Maryland Association of Counties. And the, the picture that you see of the three young boys standing outside of the fence 
and they each have the boxes, and one of them is higher for the shortest kid. And then they say, that's equity. When you provide what each person needs to see over the fence. I've challenged that, and I'm sure some of you may have seen uh, the challenge that shows those children in the stands eating popcorn and hot dogs and with waving the banner. Why should they be on the outside of the game when they should be inside with everyone else? That's equity. Equity is not sitting outside. Equity is not just looking in and saying, oh, well, I can see someone who looks like me now. I can see over the fence and that's okay. It's actually being in the stadium. It's being in the game. That's what equity is. And so from that perspective, I just want to make sure because it seems as though there are folks who are still confused about what it is. So I want to make sure from one council member's perspective, as the chair of this committee, that's what I see as equity. Madam President. Thank you. Um, so when I was like, I think I was like, 19 years old, I happened to take this class. It was an elective and it was called Multicultural Studies. This is in Columbia, Missouri, and it was taught by one of, I think, four African American professors, Professor Lois Bryant. Um, and this whole field of equity and multicultural studies was very new because this is like 1985. Um, and halfway through the semester, she kind of stopped everything and she said, We're going to have to start from scratch. And I'm feeling a little bit like that because we spent a lot of time doing this uh, racial equity and social justice training in the beginning of the year, two days of, of a workshop um, with all the leadership of the county. Um, and I'm feeling a little bit like that today. But it's okay because I think that this is a preamble to what we're gonna face when we pass our racial equity and social justice legislation because every single thing that we do, um, our budget um, adoptions or our legislation, uh, land use, whatever it is, we're going to have to look at it from this lens. And I hope that we don't use terms like pitting one against the other. I hope we don't use terms like somehow we are, you know, uh, trying to, to, to choose. You know, this, that, that is not what this is at all. And it's interesting. I mean, I was just Googling some of the things that are out there, especially in, especially in the art world. The artistcommunities.org talk about you know certain definitions of cultural equity and some affirmations. But one of the things it says is this: cultural equity is critical to the long-term viability of the arts sector. And so this is more like an umbrella conversation nationally. But let's not forget the Montgomery County of the five councilmanic districts, four are majority of color. Let's not forget that. Let's not forget the Montgomery County Public Schools. It's almost 70% of color. And so this conversation should be really uplifting <laughs> in, in so many ways because so many arts organizations are really making an amazing effort and they're doing really awesome things from Strathmore to Sanding Spring Museum. I'm seeing it, I, you know, I'm really excited about this. So it just really hurts me that here we are, we have not even adopted legislation and here we are using terms about winners and losers, pitting one against the other, in a county like ours, a very highly educated, super diverse county where every day we talk about how our diversity is our strength. So to me, this is really a preamble because it's gonna be a bumpy road, but I, I tell you, you know, there is so much potential here because at the end of the day, when you start really pursuing this programming, the revenue will come because there's so much pent up interest in a lot of these communities to attend all of these you know, events, right? I mean, somebody mentioned the Latino dance um, competition at Strathmore and it's like packed. I mean, it's like sold out. So just imagine um, what will happen uh, once we begin to normalize these conversations and these programming. Um, I think it's just, I think it's awesome. I think it's very uplifting, but I, I hope that we take a step back and not not lead with fear because this is actually really great. This is this is this is an amazing opportunity that we are um, embarking upon, um, and you know we're gonna do everything possible. I had the same conversation with somebody from Strathmore, one of the board members who called me 
you know, and, and after I clarify, it's like, no, we're not taking money away from big organizations. You know, we're creating another pot. We want to, you know, stimulate some innovation or whatever. And it was like, oh, okay, cool. So yeah, you know, maybe there is a bit of misinformation that we need to address. Um, but I just really want to say that because gosh, you know, I'm, I'm a part of me is, it's just like, it's, it's kind of sad if we're going to embark in this kind of like us versus them, because that's, you know, that's, that's not who we are here and that's not what we should be um, aspiring to be. So, so, so again, I hope that, um, that we're able to find that common ground um, as we move through a lot of these uh, important conversations. Thank you. Thank you. So let me turn to Ms. Uh, Kassiri and Ms. Lambert, uh, because certainly as uh, the county executive plays an integral role in terms of shaping our uh, arts uh, and humanities uh, funding, uh, we certainly want to hear uh, the thoughts from the county executive, not only in terms of uh, the recommendations that have been put forth by staff as well as by the Arts and Humanities Council, but also the ideas that the county executive has in terms of how to continue to support the arts in the community. So I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Kasseri. County executive continues to be a strong supporter of arts um, in all shape or form, all sizes. And, and discussion of equity, equity lenses using is, is very important. Um, I guess it's no secret, this NDA account is not a departmental account. So we are, he's very supportive of, as I said, providing support and all we know the reality is all of arts and humanity organizations are struggling, large, small, or medium. So they all need the, if, if, there, if there needs to be some sort of a support in the form of grants or other recognitions, they all need that. Um, that's all I can say. I don't know, Debbie, do you have anything to add to that? The only thing I would add is both this administration as well as the last one has chosen specifically not to allocate dollars by category. Um, there's always been a feeling that um, the Arts and Humanities Council has the expertise to reach out to the community like they are doing right now to make the appropriate allocations based on community feedback, the executive would be supportive of those continuing efforts. And um, the only times that I've seen the executive, both this administration and last, that have actually specified where they wanted to put some additional funding has been, number one, in um, starting the, the funding, the $90,000 funding for the Wheaton Arts and Entertainment District. Uh, that was something that Mr. Leggett felt very strongly about, and I believe this administration is very supportive of, as well as um, being supportive of the matching fund um, and wanting to provide that private uh, level of support that would um, allow these organizations to diversify their funding. Um, you know, that's one of the conversations that I've had with Susan, and she'll smile when I say this. One of the first things I said to her was, you know, I'm concerned about these organizations that, you know, I would like to see more diverse funding for these organizations because, you know, heaven forbid, but if there is another recession, mm -hmm. you know, these organizations are going to suffer. And so, um, you know, we uh, in the administration, both this one and the last one, have been very supportive of, of really trying to expand those funding sources. And I guess that's about all I can add. Turn to Councilmember Jawando and then Councilmember Albernos. Thank you, Ms. Chair, and it kind of got to where I was going yeah. <laughs> eventually there. So just just to be clear, um, it seems like the county executive in, is generally supportive of the direction. Would that be a fair characterization? Okay. Um, I, I will say uh, I have. G Gabe and I of often talk about this. Councilmember Alvernaz, we both have four children under 10, and uh, three of my children are at Roundhouse Theater Camp to the, uh, and having a great time, so I'll give you a shout out for that. And it's a <laughs> good job. Um, and so I, I just want to emphasize to my colleagues' points I think this is a, we are so abundantly blessed in the county to have so many great organizations that are doing so many things. Um, you know, and I, 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 my daughters were in a smaller, uh, two of my daughters were in a smaller uh, dance uh, group that unfortunately caught, came, was in this middle sized, had financial issues, had to move. It was always, I always felt like they were just, they, the programming was so great, but they just were, they just couldn't get over that hump of trying to 
get what they needed and had access to the resources. And I know there's just so many organizations like that that just have such right. great programming uh, and are such a great resource to our community. And so I'm excited about the opportunity to provide uh, resources and guidance and expertise to the whole gamut, you know, from uh, and re regardless of what type of uh, services or programming you're providing, how big you are. Uh, and I think we're just blessed and we need to come from that point in this conversation. And, and, and I, cer I certainly am uh, coming from that point that uh, we need to grow the pie and make sure that we continue to strengthen all of our organizations. So um, I appreciate everyone being here. I know we're going to talk about MCPS, so I'll wait, and we're going to talk about arts, the, the ball, too. I do have some stuff on the ball, so I'll, I'll wait on that. But thank you all for this conversation. Councilmember Albernos. Thanks. Um, I think that's a really good point, and I am excited about the direction we're going in. Uh, we need to go in this direction. We need to make sure that everybody feels comfortable and at the table, and the fact that we're addressing the baseline needs of organizations as this presentation, taking into account those unique operational needs that come with running a facility are being taken into account. Um, and so I'm, I, I'm really excited about the direction we're going in. So um, I do think that there are many vehicles and MCPS is a good example of that, of where we can expand programming options and opportunities, whether after school or during the summertime. And I do think, Ms. Jenkins, to your point, that that is an area where we have an opportunity for growth and partnerships with sister county agencies like the Department of Recreation so that we can further plant seeds um, through a lot of the, both programmatic, but also the facility aspect of this too. So there's a lot to work with there. Councilmember Friedson. Yeah, just very briefly, I uh, agree with a lot of the comments that have been made, and I, my interest is to get out of the destructive conversation of an us versus them and a winners versus losers, losers and get into the conversation of how do we grow and prove upon and build upon uh, the arts and a thriving arts community that we've always been known for and to take next steps to modernize and continuously uh, improve upon the programming and the organizations that we have in Montgomery County. So I think that's really important. I agree uh, with what's been said. I agree, uh, Chair Rice, with uh, the point about the, uh, the difference between equality and equity. I think my point that I'm trying to make is that everybody is part of that equity conversation and I think sometimes it gets lost in the public conversation and as we discuss this because your example requires a world-class institution like Strathmore to provide an opportunity to those school kids to be able to perform on a professional stage yeah. that they otherwise uh, would never uh, be able to do. That doesn't exist unless we have all different types of uh, organizations and they are all as part of uh, that focus, uh, participating in this. And, and as Ms. Jenkins said, we do have a lot of this uh, program. We have taken tremendous strides uh, in this uh, department. The arts is and continues to be for everybody, and it is continuing to be more and more for more and more. And I think that that is uh, an important part of the, the conversation. And this crosses all kinds of uh, equity issues. I, you know, I was talking about different programs off the top of my head before, and I realized that I, I see Adventure Theater here, and uh, you know, they do performances for uh, those with uh, on the autistic spectrum in our community and who have sensory uh, challenges. You have to have uh, institutional support to be able to provide specialized uh, arts opportunities like that. Almost no other place does that. We do that here. That's really important. So I think it's. Uh, important aspect to be part of the conversation and uh, totally agree with uh, Councilmember Jawando's point uh, of how blessed we are. And, you know, it's important that we don't lose sight about this as we discuss how to move forward. Uh, the key is we're blessed with assets. We want to leverage those assets in the most thoughtful way that promotes the arts in the best way that we can and allows as many people as possible to access uh, these arts opportunities, whether it be participating or you know, in performing or watching and, and, and getting uh, uh, culture. Um, and those, those assets are not just financial assets. Those assets are also the institutional assets that we uh, have in Montgomery County that have some of the, you know, the, the envies of the arts world in our region and 
uh, across the country and across the globe and allowing more people to have uh, opportunities uh, to do that. That is what makes Montgomery County such a great place. And that's what I think we need to uh, build upon. So my only uh, focus here is that we make sure that we're communicating that way, that we are engaging everybody in this process, that we do it in uh, an intentional and a transparent and an outcomes focused way. Uh, and I know that that is the goal that everybody has here. And the question now is how do we work together to make sure that we're executing uh, on that goal? Because I think that's, uh, you know, that's where the, the devil is in the details uh, on everything that we do here. And uh, that's the challenge uh, that we have before us. And uh, it's an important goal that we have. So Linda, let me turn to you. I think that we have uh, had a very robust discussion, not only about the revision of the appropriation, but also about equity in the arts. So we've covered uh, one and two. I do think it's appropriate for us to go ahead and jump to the executive arts ball. Um, I sent a memo over to the county executive back on June 12th and was very happy to hear from him that he continues to see this moving forward. Uh, Ms. Kasiri, do you have any updates? Because I know that we were looking at a different time frame now uh, as for the ball because it was too close for this fall, which I completely understand. As a former Marriott guy, it takes a lot of time to plan a yes. great event. So uh, from that perspective, uh, certainly, uh, and we want this to be the best it can to raise as much money as we can for the arts. So if you have any updates, we'd appreciate we have March it. March is our target date, and but more importantly, we're working on um, actually organizing a committee um, that can actually help us to do this. Uh, we are working uh, very closely with some of our current committee members, and we are open to any if you, any suggestion you have uh, to get this going. But yes, you're looking at the target um, March date, and then of course during the election year, we are going to switch back to the the inaugural ball event type of thing. So, uh, as Councilmember Javondo says, for the millions that are watching at home, uh, the Executive Arts Ball is looking for volunteers uh, <laughs> to join this committee. Uh, and so, uh, from that perspective, Ms. Kasiri, what's the best way? Should they just reach out to you directly? Yes, they can. Okay. All right. Uh, so, um, for those, and for, of course, obviously, those that are in the room, we'd love to have you join. This is a great opportunity. We, as a part of this year's budget, made sure that that funding was in the budget. Uh, for the matching funds, so that is there in terms of the county's commitment. So thank you very much. We are going to ensure that this moves forward. Councilmember Friedson, can I just can I just formally request that we officially ditch the black tie tuxedo deal? I just want to put that on the record. It's nice. Everybody thinks that it's cute. That is one council it's, member's view. No. It's, uh, I object. Committee will make a decision on that. Yeah. I don't take myself that seriously, and I really prefer not to wear a tuxedo. So I, I don't have a vote here on this uh, committee. I am, I am using the power of, the, of my very small oh my bully goodness. pulpit here to advocate. If you can go no tie, I'd be very, yeah, I'd be very interested, but no tuxedo, and I'm in. Councilmember Friedson, I will personally come to your house and style you, sir, so that you don't have to worry about wearing a tuxedo. Let, let the record reflect that I wore a necktie this year because I'm terrible at tying a bow tie, and I didn't have enough time to go through it 19 times, which is how long it would take me to look decent in a picture with a bow tie. It's just like tying shoelaces, I promise. All right. So, so. It's so we're very happy about that, but in, in, in all seriousness, this is gonna be incredibly important. We know how much uh, our arts organizations depend on the support. Uh, this additional time will give us some additional time to continue to ramp up in terms of our conversations about why folks uh, need to support this, uh, seeking additional sponsorship. So for those who are arts advocates and who care about the arts, I raise my hand and say that I will certainly try and make sure that we can bring some new sponsors in. We'd like to see some new folks who are getting involved and engaged. So we will be working with uh, your office, Ms. Kasiri, to make sure that that happens as well. Uh, but certainly to our greater community, uh, we wanna make sure that we can do more. The more we can do in terms of raising funding, and I'm not sure if it was your point or your point, but one of you talked about private sector and making sure, Gabe, it was you, uh, who talked about private sector and engaging, involving them, that's gonna make a difference as well. You know, one of the things when I was on the uh, Black Rock Center for the Arts uh, board for a little while, it was really about 
trying to encourage companies because the companies can then offer tickets to their employees at discounts to come to something that they've never been to before. And so it really is about trying to create these opportunities. And so the involvement is not just about sponsorship for a particular event, but it's about opening them up to all the great things that the arts have to offer. And so I do agree with you that we haven't seized as much of that as we could with the very robust uh, uh, economic development uh, corporations that are out there about how they can play a greater role in supporting our arts, which goes, Ms. Lambert, to your point of, and to Ms. Jenkins' point about diversification in terms of funding and resources, yep. because those are incredibly important. I mean, you, you know, it's great when the county is flush with money, <laughs> but we saw during the recession what happens and what happens as a result, and you are not unique. Unfortunately, our lead for libraries uh, Councilmember Duando knows all too well about how libraries still haven't recovered in that same respect. And so from that perspective, we've got to do more. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to do more with finite resources. And so it really creates a challenge. So it's going to be incredibly important. Councilmember Duando. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. And uh, not perfect segue, tonight I have my second uh, library conversation at Long Branch uh, Library, <laughs> 7 p.m. So please uh, come out if you're if you're so inclined. Um, and we'll be at Damascus next week uh, or later in the week. Um, so uh, yeah, and you're going to be coming to that uh, hopefully. Uh, we had talked about this before, Susan, about the ball, and this is to both of you. But I'm glad you're rebuilding the volunteer network. Um, I had asked about the coordination between the council and the executives on the planning of the ball. And I know that it typically, we had a really strong and really good, you know, the indomitable Catherine Leggett and, and her legacy, one of many of her legacies. Uh, and so we, there's a void there um, and, uh, or could be a void. Um, so I just wanted to know part of the resource that we might consider to add additional capacity to the council is, do you envision having a bigger role, does the county executive envision the council having a bigger role? I know you're already involved, but or, or doing things differently, that's one point. And the second would be, I really would like to see us um, liven these up a little bit and do a different format. You know, maybe you could, in the year that there's the executive that we're inaugurated, you keep it more formal and we do that, that godforsaken line. Where you know where where you know where, where where we shake everyone's hand. If you haven't been there, I can think it. of one way to loosen it up a little bit, yeah, but know, you know, know, I'm just throwing know, it out I there. I you said know? live and live. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Um, Tuxedos are a little stiff these days. They, they are, they are. Uh, but I'm just thinking, you know, theme maybe highlighting some of our great, which we do kind of in a traditional format, but highlighting some of our arts organizations. Just you know, and it could be uh, more cost effective potentially too. So, talk to both of those points. If you so can. we actually. We are considering changing the format, and, and the goal is basically to be able to uh, make it less expensive, produce more resources for the arts organization. And raise more money, yeah. And bring, sure. bring in more money. So we are considering that, but at the end of the day, hopefully committee is going to... And pull that together. Yes. Well, let me just say, I think, it would, and I'm going to let you respond, Susan, I think it, w it would be nice, and I'd love to be a thought partner in my office in helping, okay. helping you all think about different ways. I'm, I might be nominating someone from our office for the committee, but I don't know. But we'll see. Um, go ahead, Susan. Yes. Yeah. Um, when I began in 2008, the Arts and Humanities Council produced the event. But after taking a look at the budget and the cost to produce it, we saw that we could not produce the event if all of the expenses to produce the event weren't covered because it stretched our capacity and affected our budget quite negatively. So the county executive um, and Mrs. Leggett decided that they would spin off the county executive's uh, ball and that it would be produced by an independent committee in coordination with many of the organizations that we serve. And I think that that's turned out to be an exceptionally good model. Um, we haven't had the strain of production um, as a producer myself who has produced 
very, very large events. Um, it just takes all of the wind out of you mm -hmm. to produce a large event like that. So that it's going to a committee and that's been being done coordinated between the county executive and the community I think is a great thing. And so like I, I appreciate Perfect. very much. And our board has all, all also said that they are not able to produce such a large, a large event. We just don't have the capacity on top of our workload. So um, in those two ways, we're very pleased. Um, I do want to ask a question again about the county executives awards. I saw in the letter um, where the county executive responded to your um, note, um, Council Member Rice, that he anticipated that we would go forward with the county executives awards. But let me say again, that these are not the Arts and Humanities Council awards. These were the county executives awards. So Mrs. Leggett chaired the committee. She used volunteers that were on the ball committee. They sat as the uh, review committee for nominations. The county executive shaped who he wanted to give awards to by category and it wasn't while we did the production, we didn't, it wasn't our baby. Isn't that making sense? So um, when we met with the county executive the day after his inauguration, my board and I expressed uh, some questions about the awards and uh, we still have not heard directly about what the county executive will do. And so I must state publicly that we are not in a place to produce the awards because they are not Arts and Humanities Council awards. They are the county executives awards for excellence in the arts and humanities. And it would be the Mrs. Leggett, the county executive's wife, that directed that. We, we served at that pleasure. So I, I, I do need to make a note that based on where we are now and the schedule that it would have taken for us to produce it, and the fact that we are doing this guideline changing work and the racial equity trainings that we've talked about to our large and mid-sized organizations, we are not in a place where we can produce the county executives awards for excellence in the arts and humanities at this point Even in time. Even by March? I don't believe so because what we propose to you is that in the fall we'll, dra we'll serve up the draft guidelines. Then those draft guidelines get posted in, say, around Christmas time. The major response to that happens January, February, sure. March. Sure. The budget is released. We respond the to it. Going on. Sure, We're time. not in a yeah. place where we can produce at that point. For us, the timing is completely off. So I am publicly asking that if the county executive wishes to make awards while our board and staff stand at the ready to try to be as helpful as possible. We're not in a place where we can produce it and perhaps this is an opportunity for us to step back, ask the county executive what kinds of awards he'd like to give, whether or not he'd like to give them in the same manner that was given before, or if it's something simpler, say a appreciation luncheon or something that's smaller, uh, some other scale um, that our board could consider. So the plan was to use the same format that was already in place, to use the committee to help. Mrs. Leggett was one major player, you're absolutely right, but they were committee members. Um, and I think the other thing is the keys are those recipients. That's, this is for them, the people that are receiving these awards. I'm aware of that, yes. Yeah, so that's, the focus was on that, and, and, I, and I, we didn't realize that um, not having the committee in place may hinder your work. So at this point, yeah, we can talk about it, but I, I do know that um, county executive do like to continue this just because it's really benefiting those recipients. It's highlighting, right. showcasing. Yes, um, I understand. Our artists. I just need to make I, the clear think, distinction that you, these are not our right, awards. No, I think you made that point. I think right. you made your point. I think it's yeah. an offline conversation okay, here, right. how to figure it out. Right. I right. would say personally, I, I think Councilman Rice was shaking his head. I think the awards should continue. We need to lift up and highlight and, 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 highlight and, and uh, our great folks in our community. So let's 
offline, try to figure out a be the best way forward. All right, Great. thank you. Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Um, Ms. Jenkins, why couldn't you do, and setting aside this year, but why couldn't, why don't you have an Arts and Humanities Council Awards event? Is that something you've ever thought about doing? I mean, why does it have to be the county executive's awards? Why can't it be the council's awards? It hasn't been the council's awards because in the 11 years I've been here, the county executive has had awards. I haven't needed to compete with that. Right. And so were the Arts and Humanities Council to consider awards, I know our board would take a step, try to figure out how to make that most impactful. Right now, these awards are, um, to be honest with you, while I think public recognition is nice based on all of the conversations that we had today, we know that what's really impactful are resources. The awards don't come with resources. So I think that perhaps if my board, from the position that I stand in, um, thought about awards, we might think about awards that could really be impactful that may come with resources. We might think about other ways we might want to do it. But to answer your question, we don't have awards because at until this moment, we've had the county executive has done it. And I've not. You provide a lot of grants to organizations. You go through a lot of vetting. You, I mean, right. every one of your grants is a functionally an award in some respect. Yeah, but, it's true. Um, but you've, you've never had to think about a public recognition arts community event because that was already happening in whatever manner through the executive's function. But, uh, I mean, I, I got to say from a council perspective, that function was never clear to us. It was never very transparent to us, but there was a lot of trust in the county executive and you know, Ms. Leggett, and we just sort of, we just showed up. Can uh, can but I, um, I think it's an opportunity to think a little bit differently and ask the question of what would be the best program to have. Yeah. And I, I, I'm sure the county executive is also interested in having that conversation. Yes, Reba. and actually county executive, I, I know we would consider using the Montgomery County awards rather than using executive the awards. The executive probably would like to see awards yes. happening, but it may be, I, I really don't mean to be speaking for him, but it may be a little more neutral on what's the best yes. program, but yes. I don't know. And by the way, we, I, th I think um, Arts and Humanities already was funded to manage this program for this year. Is that right, for current year? The appropriation that we have wasn't explicit about the executive's awards. Uh, we've used about um, $16,000, $18,000 each year to produce that. That's not covered all the production costs to produce that. Um, and without direction, we sent a timeline, we sent information. Without direction, we just are at the point where we are not able to continue in the same way. However, as I said earlier, um, before, um, before 2008, the county executive's ball was the place where county executives awards were given. And it was disaggregated under the direction of Mrs. Leggett. But before that, the ball and the award ceremony were won. Mm. And so it may be that if this is rethought totally, that the ball, that the new event could be and council member Friedson, I come from the music industry. There's a lot of really cool things you can do with sneakers and tuxes that have nothing, <laughs> nothing to do with Maybe bow ties. Maybe not Mr. Friedson, but others. Could, nothing. You know, you know. Let me just say there's there's a lot of hip oh. things you can do, and I would be happy to help. Council Member Rice. There are not a lot of hip things that I do, but there are a lot of things you could do. We could help hip. you. So we're with the arts, that. and we're here to help. And at least while you were okay. being hip, hey, I'd be I, more comfortable. I got the floor. So wardrobe consultation is part of the next arts and humanities ball. Is that what you're okay. <laughs> so? So I think that you know I'm excited to hear what Fariba is saying because we have thought about what if this didn't happen, but we weren't in a position to 
supersede what the right. executive well, was doing, I, I but it could be that something else figure out what's could the best be done. thing to do. Absolutely. And, and, and I want to say, especially for the every four year inaugural one, I think that that has to be intentional and done differently uh, as Absolutely. well. Um, and uh, so this is great opportunity. To rethink, to, to rethink it in a way that's really impactful for the community and HIP. Right. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think when we use that word, we tend to undermine our credibility, but... Uh, I so. hope mine wasn't undermined. Well, I, you know, you're imp unimpeachable. Um, <laughs> some of us are not true. so fortunate. Uh, so... Um, okay, where, where, where are we here? We have a uh, general, uh, lots of interest in the ball, uh, the awards being rethought and, and the ball as well. That's right. That's right. So, so what we'll do is we'll ask for uh, Ms. Kassiri and Ms. Jenkins to come back with recommendations in the fall about some ideas that they may have and how the council can be supportive and, you know, un, until there's a, renaming or restructuring it's still and i want to respect the county executive it's still their function and so from that perspective until they communicate that they want to restructure and do something differently then we'll move forward but i do hear uh from the two that there is interest in that i think that's a great way for us moving forward and just pressing the reset button we've got a brand new administration a large amount of the council that's new it's a great opportunity for us to do so uh, Council Member Albernos, before we go to MCPS, and I be haven't very, forgotten about you, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I'll be very brief. Um, pro tuxedo, I think. Uh, pro black tie. Um, I, yeah, so I, let me just say a couple I things. I yeah. Um, this is a really important event, as we all acknowledge, because it is one of those few times and spaces where our entire arts community comes together under one roof one night. Um, and I think we've got an incredibly strong foundation from which to build, thanks to the work of a lot of people over a number of years. Uh, it's a great event. And so I would happily volunteer to help in any way I can, um, Mr. Chair. And um, that's it. Thanks. All right. So we're going to turn to MCPS for our last conversation. We heard uh, Ms. Jenkins from you about the Public Arts Trust and certainly agree we need to do more to make sure that we're doing that. Um, we've had these conversations year after year, and of course we haven't seen a significant increase, so we'll be having those conversations. I think that again, creatively, we may be able to structure some things a little bit differently with our CIP. We'll be approaching our six year CIP, and so we can have conversations around that and how we might be able to start over a long-term period having more investment in terms of the protection of our public arts pieces here in Montgomery County. I believe that's incredibly important, and I don't think any of my colleagues object to that. I want to turn to MCPS, and I just want to lead with one example. We have Seneca Valley High School that's about to open up, that's about to have a great CTE program. Right down the street from Seneca Valley, or I guess up the street, is Black Rock Center for the Arts. And so part of my conversation with Superintendent Smith was that not only should we be looking at some of the things in terms of what we see at Edison, in terms of automotive, uh, you know, cosmetology, those kinds of things that are traditional models that we see, but we also should be encouraging careers in the arts and culture. And I'll share with you that at Discovery, uh, uh, when Discovery was still here, uh, about two or three years ago, Jada and Will uh, uh, Smith, had their foundation had a function. And it was about, uh, and their foundation deals specifically with children in the arts and the career pathways. Not only did they have a function there where they brought in stakeholders, but then they had a function at the Fillmore and brought in children, MCPS kids, and told them about career pathways in the arts. This is what we need to do more of within MCPS. I know I've had conversations with the superintendent, and he certainly is supportive of making sure that kids have as many opportunities as possible. But what is the vision of MCPS when it comes to the arts and how do we balancing the challenges that we've had with budgetary constraints uh, and having reductions in the number of art teachers and music teachers at all of our schools? How do we balance those two things together in terms of still promoting the arts within our Montgomery County Public Schools? Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, very good points and that is the um, thing I have to think about every day. How do we balance 
Um, and because of the way that we work, it's tough. Um, there is a central office, obviously, and that's my role. My job, along with my team, is to look at their curriculum to make sure that all our students are receiving a well-rounded curriculum, a balanced curriculum. But then when it comes down to staffing, budget, that sort of thing, those are more school-based decisions. Um, the principals decide how those funds are divided. We provide best practice guidelines, but they are guidelines. Um, the principal obviously decides what their, community, what their community needs as far as their student community, what interests they have, and then the enrollment that the students have when it times to sign up for courses is what drives the courses that are offered, which of course turns into what drives the staffing. So that's how it all comes into play. Um, one thing I did want to, uh, to mention, there's a one term that's been tossed around here quite a bit today, it's been exposure. And one of the things that we as a central office do when we're looking, especially working with our community partners, is we don't just look at exposure. Exposure is just, uh, I'm going to hear a concert, I'm going to see some art, whatever the case may be. We actually like to add the terms enrichment, excitement, and engagement, and empowerment. Um, there has to be a direct curricular connection to the event that's going on, not just we're going to have them do a worksheet, usually something that builds up to it. Many of the community partners that we do work with, um, we work with their educational teams to divide such documents, design, excuse me, such documents, um, so we can work with their team to make sure that it falls in line with our curriculum and provides the students what they do need. Because as we go through our curriculum writing, which is um, obviously done by most of our teachers, we have the MCPS equity accountability model that was just rolled out, as well as the Be Well 365 program, which is rolling out, which is about social and emotional learning and such, to be better self-awareness and be um, cognizant of what is going on, not only with yourself, but in working with others. So when it looks at the act, when we're looking at the actual programs, the difference that I, um, with the CTEs, the majority of CTE programs, as I point out to Ms. Price on the phone, a lot of that comes along with separate funding from the state. Um, we don't have that. Um, those are career pathways are tied into certain grants that the state offers and they can get, you know, computer funding each year or whatever the case may be. So those certain programs are not really transferable to the art side for that concept. The second concept is that we've been actually working towards career readiness. One of the things, I've actually only been in MCPS for one year. Um, I was in another district locally for 15 years. I came down here last year, so I'm learning a lot about MCPS as we go through. Um, and one thing I did want to say is that um, I would like to echo the thought that one of the things that Montgomery County should be very grateful for is the amount of community partners that are here that are willing to do it. It's outstanding. I mean, it is absolutely one of the best things I've been involved with as we go through this. Um, but going back to the career side, since we've come in with our national standard shift, the Maryland State Standards for Fine Arts has shifted as well. It's really a paradigm shift for teachers. Um, we're really getting away from what most people think of as the arts, is that we're going to draw a picture, we're going to play our instrument, we're going to sing our song. It's a shift. It's more about the process that's going on. It's more about the students having choice. It's more about the students having voice as they go through it. So it's, um, it's really giving the students the freedom to let them have their voice and be able to do those sort of things. As an ensemble teacher for 15 years, I will tell you that is a challenge because you've got 80 kids in one classroom literally trying to do something as individuals or small groups. It's a big challenge. Um, but that is one of the things that ties into the career pathways. Those are the moments we like to seize where students can tie and can explore what's out there. And you know, we, just because of the way the higher education program works in most cases, you're geared towards education or you're geared towards performance or you're geared towards music production or arts production. You don't hear much about arts management, which is something totally else. You don't hear anything about just working, you know, nonprofit work, for example, is another pathway. So as we're dividing, designing our curriculum and going down the road, those are the things that we're trying to incorporate into our curriculum, um, especially at the higher levels in high school, because when you get into high school, you have to have that uh, fine arts credit to graduate, whereas middle school is about a specialization in the area and the elementary school is exposure in English, and, or sorry, in English, <laughs> they get that too, um, and visual arts and music. So they specialize in middle school, add dance and theater and media arts, and then high school is the high school graduation credit. So by the time we get to high school, they kind of have an idea what they want to focus on or have an interest in, I should say. And the idea is to kind of start incorporating some career pathway ideas into that. But again, because of class sizes and staffing, it's just a lot to try to fit into what we're doing with the curriculum. So 
Let me ask you along those lines, because uh, when it comes to our uh, preparation for kids and their futures, um, our guidance counselors slash career counselors aren't always that well versed in terms of careers in the arts. And mm -hmm. so that's one of the things I see that we can do outside of a staffing model from a budgetary perspective of just making sure that our staff that are already there are much more well versed in terms of how to guide our children who are interested in the arts that it's not just about you know being a big you know movie star or record or recording artist and that's not the only career in the arts but to be a gaffer in the mm -hmm. movie industry is good money I mean, so, you know, from, from that standpoint, you know, we need to make sure that our guidance counselors are really equipped with the knowledge base that truly encompasses all that there is to offer. And just as you said, you've got the wide array of community partners that are there that can give all of these folks the information about what's there. So I do think that a greater synergy between MCPS in terms of career and guidance counselors and the greater arts community and talking about those kinds of things will help to lead some of those folks in understanding about the different career pathway opportunities that are out there. Yeah, we'd also like to work with the partners um, to develop internships and job experience type things as we go through. Yeah. Again, speaking specifically to the higher level students that kind of know, they have those foundational skills they've gotten maybe their freshman, sophomore year, so now they're getting to where they need the real specific skill sets and such. Excellent, let me turn to Council Member Jawanda. Thank you, Councilman Rice. Perfect segue. Uh, I was going to actually bring up the the internship uh, you know, work based learning experience for students. You know, I had the honor and privilege to be on the other side of the dais and work with Council Member Rice as an advocate, and then run the Summer Rise program, uh, which many of our students are participating in right now. Three week mm -hmm. career experience program. Some at arts organizations, I believe. Um, I see a couple, four, four at Strathmore. There you go. I got the number. Anyone else? Do anything right about? I'll do my councilman right. Two there. Okay, two there. And here we go. So, so we've got we've got several at, and and I would encourage all arts organizations on the, on your side, as we've seen step up in recent years during the third year of the program, continue to offer those experiences during during the summer, but also during the year to the internship coordinators at the schools. Uh, one of the things I know the school bo school uh, board is discussing, and I've talked to Dr. Smith about, is I think every high school student should have a work-based learning experience before they graduate. I mean, I just think you know, it doesn't have to be in the arts, but they should have an opportunity. Right now, if you go to high schools with two or three thousand kids, you have internship programs that have a hundred or two hundred students in them, um, and and part of that is they don't have enough people offering them, but or the necessarily expertise, or the it's a it's a big workload. So we want to be partners with you and as you develop those additional opportunities. And I think the, the Arts and Humanities Council, Council potentially, not to put more on your plate, but could <laughs> have, have a role here uh, in potentially training for some of the, you know, uh, mm -hmm. for MCPS, uh, as was discussed, and how to identify and funnel people to our great art, arts organizations who are interested in those careers and those pathways. So I am really interested in that. I, I, to Council Member Rice's point, not only is it lucrative, but it, it, you know, these types of experiences just unlock potential in, in, in students' minds and they get so excited. So actually comment on any of that. I, um, since you mentioned Summerize, this summer is our first time we've had a side program that's partnered with Summerize. It's called Smart Summer. Um, and it ties in really a, a K-12 type setup. And w the way it's organized is it occurs during the Summerize session. So it's so three weeks in the summer. We have F uh, MCPS teachers who work with high school students. We have 10 high school students that signed on. They're the summarized participants. They're actually learning about how you do planning within visual arts, how you teach lessons, how you design resources, awesome. create resources. And then those mentors, the high school students, are actually co-teaching with the regular MCPS teachers, elementary students that are involved wow, in the program. And so great. I think it's a little over 100 students, 200 students. That is great. Um, so it's been a, it's been summer. super successful. Yes, smart summer. Awesome. It's been super successful. Uh, it's been great working with the Summerize staff, and that's actually one of the things that we'll be moving forward to probably branch out into other areas of the arts. Good. Well, that's great. And, yeah, and maybe great. we can – my one substantive idea was the maybe connection of the training piece to the counselors because I know that they are – and, we, and there needs to be additional capacity for them, but I think that could be helpful and be a resource to them, and the council could help. So thank you. Mm -hmm. 
So again, I don't want to uh, seem like we're giving this short shrift because it's incredibly important. I know the hour is getting long, but I just want to say again that, look, in, in my conversations with the superintendent, he's been incredibly supportive of us continuing to do more. I think that strategically when we look at uh, what's going to happen with some of the recommendations around uh, uh, CTE, our career and technical education programming, via the recommendations that came out of the Kerwin Commission, uh, there's going to be even more opportunity for us to focus on getting into career pathways that include our arts and humanities and culture. And so from that perspective, it's a plus for us as we start to specialize. I know uh, that when the magnet program first started uh, and we had our math science, computer science program, and then we had our, you know, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, humanities, uh, arts and humanities uh, magnet program that both of my cousins went through uh, at Eastern. Um, it's, it's, it's one in which folks realized back then how important the arts were. And this is back in the 80s. This is a long time ago when we realized there were two tracks that were important in Montgomery County in the school system. Math, science, computer science, so STEM, and the arts. That's what we chose back in the 80s. It's now 2019. I haven't seen a lot more advancement from where we were then. And so I think that, again, just in seeing what we know is happening with our uh, whether it comes to social media and graphic arts and all the things that we're doing with computers and everything else, there's so much that's associated with the arts that it's doing our children a disservice to not give them more of those opportunities. And we seem to have lagged behind uh, what we're seeing the rest of the world uh, doing, which you know then encompasses some of our lag. You know, folks always want to attribute well, we're losing in biotech and we're losing in life sciences and all these other kinds of things. We're losing in culture too. Uh, and that's one of the things when I go to other countries, whether it's for sister cities or just for personal travel and see, and I take a picture of what's happening in these other communities, uh, when it comes to their uh, support of the arts, it's very different. Uh, and it's one in which I think that we overall, when it comes to uh, the social and emotional well-being of our children, uh, which is a key core content, uh, uh, tenant of what uh, MCPS is focused on, understand all too well that that plays an integral role. You know, like that young man from uh, the middle school that shall remain nameless uh, who told me his story. That's what this is about. Um, this is really about us ensuring that from all the way from the beginning, when a child first is learning how to draw before they know how to write letters, I mean, just think about it. They're learning how to draw pictures before they're writing letters. And they're drawing a picture, and that is the foundation. That's the arts right there. And at, at, at some point, we've lost that connection all the way through that can matriculate you know, to uh, career pathways and an enriching of our greater community. That's the reason why I feel personally that this, syn this synergy between education and culture uh, makes so much sense because it is truly across that timeline that we see that we have our kids. And then as we look to all of our kids to go into careers, we haven't had conversations as much about arts and humanities careers, about arts and culture careers. And that's been a mistake for us. But we can change it. Uh, and I think we have the opportunity to do so. Part of it is intentional through policies uh, and our budget uh, oftentimes speaks to our priorities as well. So uh, we need to make some adjustments there. Uh, but it is in partnership with all of our community partners as well, making sure that we continue to lift up uh, arts and humanities and culture in our community and make sure that people understand just how important it is. I really want to just close. I don't see any other lights here, but close by thanking all of our community partners who each and every day have done the due diligence of making sure that they're uh, imparting how important the arts are and how you continue to fight for uh, the arts. It hasn't been easy for any of you. Whether you're big, middle, or small, you've all struggled. Some of you have been able to work up to uh, getting to that point of being uh, big or a mid uh, from when you were once a small. Um, it's, it's, it's one in which uh, we know 
how much it is a part of us being Montgomery County. We uh, benefit from your hard work. Uh, and so I want to make sure that you know and understand that we appreciate that uh, because it is incredibly important to us. Uh, we would not be the Montgomery County we are if it were not for the work that you guys put in. And so uh, from that perspective, I just want on behalf of this uh, uh, committee and uh, the other representatives uh, from the council that are here say thank you. Um, it's going to be uh, a little bit of a change uh, to some extent, but not. Um, we will continue to support the arts. We're just trying to figure out how to grow in terms of our expanded support of the arts. That's the key, and I want to make sure that folks understand that. Nobody's walking away from support. Uh, nobody's walking away from saying that the arts is no longer, it, it, you know, it, it, it is, is no longer important or anything like that. Um, what we're saying is how do we strategically grow opportunities to ensure that we're outreaching to get as many people in touch with the arts as possible uh, in a way that uh, ensures that those that are privileged as well as those who are not, all get access to what we know is incredibly important to everyone. Everyone should be able to have their touch with the arts. Um, from, uh, I'll close with the personal perspective from my daughter who took a cake decorating class. So she's in culinary arts. And um, uh, as we were walking in the state fair that she didn't want to go to because she just knew that she wasn't going to place and why did we even waste our time going and as we walked to the place where um, the ribbons were uh, she said see I told you my cake's not even here and the woman who was helping us at the fair said well maybe you should check over in this other section at the front and so as we walked over uh, to this other section that had a little bit of a different color ribbon on them because they were grand champions. And I saw her face as she saw her cake that she had worked so hard for to decorate. Um, that says something. That says something about what it is about our kids and how we can be supportive of them in the arts and what a belief it means for them, like that little boy, about how you can uh, instill in somebody the belief in themselves. That's what the arts does. That's what it does. It's not just an A on a report card, but it's something like that too. We can't forget about that. And so, um, you know, I, I look forward to working with all of you, all of you as community partners, as community advocates, uh, as we continue to build up uh, the arts in our community, uh, not only back to where it once was, but well beyond that as well. So, uh, Ms. Price. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge, acknowledge that Rachel McGrain also is here from Arts Education in Maryland Schools. One of the items included in your packet was an update on Art Look, if the committee wanted to go through that. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yes. Come on up. I'm sorry. I apologize. I did, I did miss that. That's incredibly important. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Ms. Rachel. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rachel McGrain. I'm the Development Director at Arts Education in Maryland Schools. Um, Susan uh, touched on this a little bit before the Art Look Maryland project that we're working on. Um, it ultimately will be a statewide project, but in this uh, first year we are piloting with four districts, including Montgomery County, um, the other districts being Baltimore City, Anne Arundel County, and Queen Anne's County. And the um, Kind of the big goal behind this is to showcase what is going on in Montgomery County and ultimately statewide in the arts. So all of the public schools will have profiles that show things like um, which arts disciplines are offered at the schools, how many certified arts teachers there are, minutes of instruction that kids are receiving, as well as the programming, arts education programming that's happening outside of those um, traditional Format. So, for example, if they're partnering with an outside arts organization, it will also show that. And then the arts organizations themselves will have profiles that will showcase all of the amazing programming that's going on. 
and that will help facilitate collaboration between those two entities, between the school systems and the arts community at large, and will also provide a larger uh, view of the larger landscape for, for example, the city count, uh, the uh, county council, um, and all of those decision makers to see the the whole view of what's going on, and so we can figure out where are those gaps. Where do we need to direct that funding? Where can we strategically figure out how to invest so that we are um, advancing equity? That's, that's, that's incredible. And I think that, again, as we oftentimes ask for data, uh, that gives us where the holes are. And I know that our county executive is one who's always uh, been an advocate for that. Uh, it will give our community partners an opportunity to step up in those areas and say, hey, this is an area where there's not a lot of things that are going on, unfortunately. Just as you said, uh, Mr. Rumpf, when it comes to a certain principal, that they're not really, they just don't have the programming that's there at that school, and they can come in and serve and work with that greater community in making sure that we have that access that's there. I think that's phenomenal. And so when will this be live in terms of the data? So we are currently collecting data. Um, we're working on getting administrative level data from the school districts as well as reaching out to individual arts partners. Our goal is for it to be publicly launched by the end of this calendar year. Um, we're working with, um, with our partners in Ingenuity. So they've created the original model of Artlook and have it implemented in Chicago. They've been doing it since 2012. Um, so we are working on the data collection and um, timeline could get pushed a little bit, but we're hoping for December 2019. Excellent. So it sounds like almost just in time for budget. <laughs> Very strategic in timing. If I, if I might make just one more remark, please. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that a colleague of mine is doing in Seattle or has done for several years now is, um, and as we talk about seeing ourselves, right? Uh, kid, I never knew that the work that I do now was a career to aspire to. I was going to be a pediatrician. Um, working in the arts was something that I never even thought was possible. I didn't know what kind of jobs there were. I didn't know what a gaffer was. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to do that, right? So when you don't see yourself, you don't know. And I think it's the same as we think about working with county departments. If they've never worked with an artist before, if they don't come from the perspective that, that we as artists come from, they don't understand how we can be incorporated in their work. Oftentimes when I talk about a public art project, the first oftentimes response is, boy, art would be great, but I just don't have the money for it. And if I say, well, do you need lights in your project? Well, yeah, yeah, we need lights. Well, you know, there's another aesthetic way that we could put lights in that aren't just these plain floodlights. You know that if you need a bioretention wall, you could have a gray concrete wall, or we could have something that's more aesthetically pleasing, more artistic. So I just want to bring up the idea is that as we are looking at all of our departments, all of our departments, that my colleagues in Seattle have a great model for embedding artists in county departments. So there's always an artist at the table. When the decision is being made, there's an artist at the table that's talking about how that will affect the arts community. When we talk about having a seat at the table, I say either you have a seat at the table or you're part of the meal. Oftentimes, we are part of the meal because the seat that we're given at the table is the seat way in the back that hasn't allowed us to participate in the conversation in a cogent way. So if we are looking at create, creating a demand for careers in this fabulous, fabulous sector that I work, um, the way that we can do that is that students would see themselves. They would see this work and they would understand that it's great, wonderful, rewarding work. And I think that there are ways that we can do that in the county that may be, you know, not so much about budget, but all about intention. And as we do the work together, I think just being intentional about putting the arts and humanities, building a creative sector, you know, coming up with strategies for equity, I know we can do that, but, but it's all about our intention. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much for that. I don't see any of the lights from my colleagues. Ms. Price, have we missed anything? Everything. Okay, so um, we will come back to this. You see that we went almost three hours uh, today, and quite honestly, we could have gone even longer. Um, I, I think that, again, this is the beginning. Uh, this is the beginning of an arts renaissance here, and that's my hope. Uh, my hope is, is that we come up with uh, new and innovative ways in which we can continue to expand uh, opportunities for uh, arts throughout our community. And I look forward to working with each and every one of you. We'll come back this fall uh, to, uh, to look at some of the issues that were presented there. I know Ms. Rubin has an OLO report on some of the uh, arts uh, issues that uh, we are uh, looking at. And so uh, from that perspective, there's a lot more to come this fall. Uh, as we prepare for the budget and look forward to working with the county executive uh, and making sure that we can step up. We look forward to great information uh, coming from some of our partners from data collection that help us that are arts advocates and um, we'll uh, have more to say. All right. Thank you very much. We're adjourned.